Lightning strikes twice! Okay, Damon! Splice are gonna be your season five world champions! You, you, Long live the game! Absolutely! Splice! Damon! Down for three! It has been an absolutely incredible weekend of Smite. We've seen champions fall and underdogs rise. But when kings on their thrones face titans on their summits, anything can happen in the battleground of the gods. It is time for the season nine Smite World Championship Grand Finals. Introducing first to the stage, your number one seed, the Camelot Kings! He may look like a surfer, dude, but he's also the brain of the team. From Australia, it's Coach Biggie! He's a multi-role specialist, now in the hunter role, from Colombia, Yak the Shark! The former support player, now in the mid lane, looking to do big man things. From the UK, it's big man things. Championships from the UK, it's Captain Twig! And last but certainly not least, just his player name is just like his god pool from the UK. It's Variety! Ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time for your number one seed, the Camelot Kings! Now join me and please welcome to the stage the next team that has run the gauntlet and remained standing, the Tartarus Titans! <laughs> the battle for the best hair in coaching 
continues with a mastermind and leader of many of the Greeks, it's Slaney! The young talent has gotten hard at the right time with an electric performance already this weekend. Please welcome to the stage, Big Stu! Next, one of the greatest to ever do it. Season 5 world champion and personality through season 1, it's a Raw the Chunk! With four final appearances in a row, and now with two rings on his hand, He's just gaming! It's Paul! It's like he never left. A player that has always marched to the beat of his own drum, establishing his own meta. It's Dino! And last but certainly not least, mechanically a step ahead, a powerhouse of aggression, and a pioneer of the short lane. Please join me in welcoming Solo or Troll! An electric intro for what is sure to be an exciting set. Again, the Kings taking on the Titans. Welcome everyone to the desk just before the games kick off. It's Gormanzar, I got Hazer and Hurry, and we are excited more than anything. I think I'm gonna overuse that word. So I gotta find, I'm gonna have to buy a thesaurus. I've got a computer in front of me. It is amazing what these teams have been able to do and Hurry, the energy in here right now is just through the roof. Dude, I'm like shaking. I'm not even playing. <laughs> I can't imagine how it feels to be up there, and I can't imagine how it feels just to be in the crowd right now with just so many fans that are just so amazing. I mean, we've been at this event now for a few days. The fans are insane. Everyone is so into it. Everyone is so loud. Everyone is ready to root for their favorite teams, and I couldn't be any more excited, Gore. Yeah, especially we're in that area, right? Out there, there are Kings fans, there are Titans fans, and there are Smite fans, right? All of them are going to be, well, rooting for something today. Some of them are going to be rooting for both sides as long as we get good games. That uh, is what I am thinking of. But again, it's Stu. We've got to make sure that you at home know. Uh, <laughs> Stu, Big Stu, as uh, he was called and has been named, especially when he has the hand as hot as it is. Uh, but Hazer, you know, the things that, the, the, that we've been looking at, and especially, you know, we, we, we talked about Paul up there. We've talked a little bit uh, about Twig. We've talked about Variety. Twig, though, is the one I want to latch on to uh, because out of all of this, out of the people who have been in the scene the longest, Twig is one of those just long runners. He has been here at the launch tournament. He was here in season one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. Now all the way to nine. Still hasn't gotten the lift that hammer just yet. 
And that's what he's looking to do today. Yeah, he's been pretty close, right? Three finals, Twix made it to, not managing to get it over the line in any of them. An incredible player, incredibly consistent over the years. The only player to make it to all nine, which I think deserves some celebration. And he'd like to celebrate it with a win, I reckon. I think he wants to get himself that ring. He doesn't talk about it that much, but I like to think I know Twix. I know how much this yeah. would mean to him. This is what we compete for. This is what people compete for. This kind of atmosphere and to win a ring in front of all those people would mean so much to him. Well, especially, and you know, we've talked to him about it. We've had this conversation. Hands down has to be one of the most accomplished Smite players, period. Mm -hmm. Just based on every world championship appearance, he's done that more, you know, he's made it where Zatman hasn't, despite the fact that that's the three time. He's done it where Barra hasn't, despite the fact that he was one of the first world champions. He's done something no other player has. And then when you start racking up the runner-ups, right? Yeah, it might not be the first place, but the seconds that he's got and the amount of times it's dominating Hurry in the regular season as well, you are talking about a guy who has left such a large impact on Smite, whether it's in the meta, in mid, if it's in jungle, he has just done so much for this game. Now, being on that stage might as well just be feeling like he's at home. I do think that is probably where he feels right now, especially after such a fabulous weekend so far from him and the rest of the team. I will say it's a good conversation to have here about the ring, because as good as everyone says Twig is, those haters, which there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's a lot we of them. We see you in the post-game threads. They are going to say, no ring. <laughs> if you don't have a ring, then you can't be one of the greats. Yeah. And this is the best chance I think we've seen him have so far. I'm sure we've said that times in the past, but I truly believe that. And I think a lot of people today truly believe that this is his best chance to get that ring. It's going to be an emotional day, yeah. whether it be him winning, whether it be the Titans winning. Um, but I kind of get a little emotional just thinking about some of these guys getting a chance to win here today. And I think ultimately it's going to be amazing. Yeah, and you have to talk about it, and maybe we'll talk about him a little more. Aurora, who you can see behind me, standing up there beside him. Again, another player who has been here forever. A guy who has a steel trap for a mind when it comes to Smite. Again, you ask him something he was scrimming in Season 2, he's probably got the stats for it, uh, and he'll correct me. And that's something, I've got computers to tell me things, and he knows it better, faster. And again, the two of them, the mark they've left on this game has been incredible. And they're standing by on the stage with Kelly for an interview. Welcome, everyone, Aurora and Captain Twig. Aurora, you guys had an incredible set yesterday going to a game five. How is your team feeling for the competition today? We're feeling really good. I mean, we're just as excited as everybody else that's here, and I'm really, I'm, I'm ready to get in these games. Twig, you have made it to every single Smite World Championships. What would it mean to you to finally win the title? It'd mean everything. I've been uh, pursuing this for nine years, um, and it'd mean absolutely anything. But I'm so grateful to be here already and privileged to be here. So thank you. Aurora, this event wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for these fans right here. What do you have to say to them? Thanks for coming. Thanks for liking Smite as much as I do. It really means a lot. It, that's all I could really say. It's, it's, it's just a great thing here that we got going on. Twig, same question for you. Anything you'd like to say to the fans watching here and to the thousands watching at home? Thank you so much. Uh, it's been amazing. The support's been unreal. Thank you. And hopefully see you next year as well. And for my final question, is there anything that you would like to say to your opponents? It's going to be fun. Captain Twig? Good luck. All right, everyone. Gentlemen, take your seats, and let's head to the desk. Thank you. It's going to be fun. It's such an Aurora thing to have before a final set. <laughs> that is such an Aurora. Not just the good luck, but the like, you know what? He's just gonna have fun playing Smite. Yeah, and, and you know, this is something I said about, you know, if you look towards the Dragons, you look towards the teams that were eliminated in the quarterfinals. But Hazer, just getting to play 
the best of the best, playing the best teams in the world on a stage like that, it feels incredible once you get over the sting that is the defeat that, that potentially could come your way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, imagine getting to compete to be the best in the world at something. Absolutely. How that feels, people out there cheering you on. You know, I'm sure we all went through when we were young, playing video games, having fun. Parents are telling you, you know, get out there, do something yeah. worthwhile with your life. And look at, the, look at us now, look at them now out on that stage, ready to compete in front of all these fans. It's just incredible. And hurry, I mean, you, you even recently are still working at that exact kind of thing. I mean, how does it feel playing, especially like, I mean, having this level of support uh, in a game that we all love? Smite is just a very alive thing. And this year was a very interesting year for me because I got to coach, I got to play in the minor league, mm -hmm. and I got to be in the pro league. And through all of that, he does it all. There's so many <laughs> people, and I'm an analyst. I mean, we could go on, I'm sure. But ultimately, my point I'm trying to make is there is a lot of livelihood left in this game. Yeah. There's a lot of livelihood left in the community. You don't always see it on the forefront, but I've met so many new amazing people this year, and it's been nothing but a pleasure to have that opportunity and be humbled yeah. this year. Of course, you know we talked a little bit about Twig, talking about the other guy that stood up there, Aurora. Uh, not just. It's going to be fun. But even beyond that, again, he's so analytical. He loves the game, Hurry. He, he plays it in and out. He thinks about it a lot. Uh, he is one of the guys that if you can just sit down, and, and I recommend it, if anybody ever gets the opportunity to sit with a roar and just talk smite, it is one of the most pleasurable experiences that you can have. It is just so fun to hear the way he views the game, what he remembers about the game. You know, He'll tell you what players he was up against uh, in some random matchup. Uh, it has been fantastic to see what he has been able to do, but we're getting ready. Picks and bands for game number one, the Titans. First pick over the Kings. Of course, these bands are going to be important. Hazer, one thing you had wanted to talk about is adjustments coming into picks and bands, and specifically uh, what these teams have been able to do, and, and more so maybe the Titans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Kings have a lot of tape on the Titans right now. Yeah. The Kings have only played five games so far. The Titans, all the way to seven, a couple extra games of content for Biggie and the boys to study. So I'm interested to see what adjustments the Kings have come up with. It looked like we watched Paul try to be banned out in yeah. the semifinal, and it seemed like it wasn't too much avail. Uh, so I'm interested to see how the Kings adjust and who they opt to target in this set. The crowd excited by the Maui band. We saw what genetics can do on this pick. And we know it needs to be corralled. They're going to take out the Ishtar as well to a resounding cheer. Hurry, the one that catches my eye the most, though. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about Sot early in the pre-show. Mm -hmm. Imaterasu, something that they've been running, looking incredibly good on. The Naja as well, banned out from Sino. Uh, it feels like they, they figured out some target bands over towards the Titans. Yeah, a little bit of a mix here on what they wanted to take away. They kind of picked and chose what they wanted to get rid of. They decided they're not target banning Paul. Oh my god. They're going to let him have what he wants to have. We'll see if that really ends up paying off. I think the Kings maybe were hoping that was a Thanatos first pick because I know they do play the Hebo as well. Yeah. Titans will be getting the Hebo though. Paul looked nothing short of fantastic on that pick so far. Definitely a big problem pick for him. Ymir for genetics. <laughs> What do you I, got to say about that? I'm geeking out a little bit. Hebo was the first Whoa. god I got diamond. Back before it was even diamond, back when it was still just legendary to hit rank 10. Ymir, the second one, my favorite guardian. And Hazer, to see them both. First off, Hebo first. I, I want to dig into that. It feels like there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you pick them up at the very top. Yeah, absolutely. One of these gods is very much feast or famine. He does so, so, so much damage. But if you get caught out, say, by a Ymir wall, for example, <laughs> you can very easily end up in a lot of trouble. And you've got to be in close mm -hmm. to do your damage. That so maybe this is confidence. Absolutely. And, and this is a contested pick between the two, obviously. Twig running this Hebo in the jungle, and Paul running the Hebo in mid. So it does get first pick for the Titans. And I don't know if you can hear that crowd, yeah. but they want a Thanatos pick here. Will sign off by They're yes, going to get it. And the Kings have to expect that Thanatos pick. It was open. They banned away the nausea. This is the jungler that Sino plays that they're willing to play against. We'll see if it pays off for them as this draft continues. And the Cupid, or the Stupid, if you will, mm. for Stu. Yeah. You can hear the Stu chants, the calls. Look, a guy who joined halfway through season seven, but has really grown into the role in season nine. Sorry, season eight is when he joined. Season nine is now uh, where he has just made and left a mark. Stu. 
has been a pleasure to watch in the duo lane. But to match the energy the Titans are throwing out, Hunbats locked in for Captain Twig Hazer. Iconic pairing. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about it in the semifinal. This is probably Twig's most iconic character. You know, he's thrown out the Kuzin jungle every now and again, but the bats is what he goes to when everything's really on the table. I'm interested by this pick, though. I was expecting, I mean, maybe this Ymir is the counter, but I was expecting more explicit counters in the draft here. It feels like both teams are just kind of gravitating towards what they're comfortable on, what they've done well mm -hmm. on so far, rather than like, for example, maybe a Circuit to counter the Thanatos or something like that. It seems like teams are really comfortable to play their own game in game one, hurry. Yeah, I think, Paul, it's going to be a bit of a feeler match for both of these teams, kind of seeing what the other team is really doing. Once they're in, once you're in the game playing against these teams, it's a lot different than when it feels like spectating. So I think they all want to be on something where they're comfortable. Uh, I do want to talk a little, about, a little bit about this Cupid pick, a pick that fell out of favor not too long ago, but still sees some play. Netroid actually let me know that this is the best late game hunter because he brings healing to the table. He has a fantastic team fight ultimate. The heart bomb is a two and one CC as it's a slow into a stun. I think he's a little bit underpicked. I think it looks pretty good in the enemy team comp as well. I think the Rama yeah. Cupid matchup can go either way, but we haven't seen it picked top three very often. With a lot of the other ADCs off the table, I do like seeing that for, for Stu. I do know it's a pick that he's comfortable on. And notably now going to the bans, the Kings are gonna ban away the Sylvanas. Titan's going to ban away the Odin, which is interesting. Yeah, the uh, I mean, walls, right? Like, we're talking walls on walls. You've got two guys there that can't get out, and Thanatos would have to use his ult. Feels like it's the, you know, like, maybe, like, yes, Phantom Shell exists, but <laughs> we like to not have to rely heavily on the relics. So maybe just some safety in there, Hazer. Uh, the Sylvanas, though, still catches me. Uh, well, I say off guard. Pulls, the setup, uh, I think, Hurry, you had mentioned it yesterday, the, the cooldowns that it can have something that the, the Titans maybe, or sorry, the Kings are a little worried about, along with the Guan Yu, which is something Sot's been playing a lot lately. Yeah, maybe they're worried about the lane pressure here. They picked yeah. Ymir Ram, so it's a lane which is hard to beat. But one of the characters you can stick in the duo lane to win almost every lane is Sylvanas. Those AoE auto yeah. attacks can help for, for duo lane pressure. So maybe this is something the Kings want to play against, and this is why they've uh, they've isolated that lane and looked to win the pressure there with the Ymir Ram lane. Guan, Ban, I mean, it's just something that Sots looked so, so yeah. good on. And Sustain may be the name of the game here. Two characters with heals in their kits, banned out by the Kings. Maybe they want to make sure that the Titans can't disengage, re-engage, Thana and Cupid already having Sustain. Well, notably talking about Sustain, something Paul has liked and has actually been banned away from him a couple of times this week in the Hell, mm -hmm. which while we haven't been seeing it a whole ton, is something that he has gone to. Uh, but with the Hebo there, right, Thanatos there, you're pretty certain you can hedge your bets against that one. The Kings may be able to pick that up if they're feeling really confident. Uh, but that is a different route to go. Uh, you know, we had mentioned the Odin ban. Robin banned out as well. Vulcan. We were telling people not to forget it when it comes to Paul, but you cannot forget the Mark Hurry that BMT has on the game. Grabbing the Vulcan just feels like it's going to go right at home. Yeah, BMT was the one who really pulled this pick out when Aegis was out of the game for a short bit earlier on in this season and I think made it look like it needed to be removed. Uh, since Aegis has been added back to the game, he is still one of these players that maybe it still needs to be removed. He performs very <laughs> highly on this character. He's very consistent in what he does. I think Vulcan is an excellent pick as well in that he brings a lot of objective damage, a lot of objective secure to the table, which has kind of been the name of the game in a lot of these games and the sets these, this, uh, this last weekend. So I think that... Vulcan is a good pickup for him. I'm glad to see him go towards that. I think a lot of these teams, this is kind of continuing on the trend of holding off on the spice a little bit, with the exception of maybe the Thanatos, but at this point, that's regular yeah. somehow. Uh, but the rest <laughs> of the draft for all these teams looks like a lot of comfort picks for everyone, a lot of standard stuff. Uh, two mages notably as well. This is a mage versus mage matchup. We've been seeing a lot of hunters, maybe even assassins yeah. over this weekend, but we're going to get to see a mage versus a mage, which is exciting as well. And, and not just mage, but like burst hazer that's going to be coming into this that, that's kind of been lacking over the weekend. Yeah, plenty of burst there. So objectives going to be maybe in a lot of danger here. You want to be want to be dice rolling them in front of either Paul or Big Man Tings. And I wanted to touch again on this Vulcan. Backfire the recently this year got triple immunity on it, so can backfire out of that Fields of Love from Cupid. Another good idea for the Vulcan pick here as we see Atlas and Tyr. Oh, wow. For the Titus. Uh, look, I'm going to be honest with you, Harry. I see the, the win rates of them, and I, I'm not feeling as confident there, but only one game played for the Tyr. Three on the Atlas hasn't had the most successful weekend. I'm going to give you a hot take. 
I, okay. I had become an Atlas hater. I still think the character the man has been underperforming. You've turned your back I, on him. Atlas is a good pick into <laughs> Ymir when it comes to stifling the early aggression. Falter. The amount of displacement he has for an immobile character is just it, really crazy. It's really easy to set up ganks in the, in the minutes 1 through 10. It depends on how much aggression we see on this duo <laughs> side of the map. I think that will be the name of the game. I know Genetics is feeling himself. I know Aurora is feeling himself. There's probably going to be a lot of communication happening on that side of the map. So I do think Atlas could be great at punishing this Ymir. And then, notably, as we saw the crowd cheering, Mulan, the final pickup for Varieties, look nothing sort of fantastic on that pick as well. What do you think, Hazer? Yeah, I mean, I remember the last time we saw Variety yeah. last pick this Mulan. It was Discordia Mulan, game five of that phase three playoff final. And he ran the game. I don't think I've ever seen him run a game like that since maybe season three Worlds, where yeah. he maybe should have picked up that MVP. It's good energy to have coming into. So what do you say out there? Are you ready for the finals? They're ready, are they? I think they're a little bit ready. Well, I've got good news for you. Game one's gonna be kicking off. We're gonna go over to Dave and Mifflin to start things up. That's right, Gormizer. That's right, Arlington. It's the grand finals. And it's the Camelot Kings up against the Tartarus Titans. Now, Miff, we've gotten a heat check on the crowd in general. I'm gonna ask for a little bit more noise here. I wanna hear the Kings fans right now cheer their team on going into this final matchup. Okay. All right, they got a little support out there, but the introductions for the Titans, Miff, they were loud. There's some Titans fans out there hoping to find a win for their team. It's a little louder. Call it evenly split. I don't know, the Taurus Titans, I think they might have the edge here with the crowd. They might, Miff. There are so many intertwined storylines between these two teams. It's something we've talked about with the Warriors and the Dragons earlier on this weekend. Now the Kings and, and the Titans and that old rival team and how great they were, just not crossing that finish line, opportunities for players and coaches from that era to finally get their ring. Paul has gone to four world championships in a row. He's won a couple of them. That's right. And they've officially arrived. Yeah, I'm so excited for this match. Every single game this year, all year, culminating up until this point in a best of five to close out season nine. And when you look at the God pools, when you look at the selections for both these teams, it's comfort across the top, man. It I mean, is. every single one of these picks is associated so closely with the players taking them home. Uh, I, I think it really is a statement game. Game one, as always, I say it every time, <laughs> it's it could be two. the most important. No, no, no. Game two is the most important. I'm no, not you know what, Myth? For once, I'm going to agree with you. I think setting the tone here in the grand finals is going to be the most important. Let's delay no further. Game one of the Smite World Championship Season 9 Grand Finals. It's kicking off. And what a matchup we've got. j Max said it great during the end call yesterday. Maybe what a team that's not supposed to be here. And they're not going to give us a chance to settle in. All five of the Tartarus Titans hugging the back fire giant wall. Now, this goes wrong if Variety overextends, but looks like he's closer to that Pyromancer pit. And I think the Tartarus Titans close to bailing on this one. They'll back away, but potentially trying to catch one of the Camelot Kings overextended. Man, that's a season five classic right there. The five stack, try and catch anybody stepping up to ward that blue who, buff. Who won in season five? <sighs> Wasn't me. It Wasn't you. That's right. Was it, it was, a, was it a Aurora and Sano and that squad? They're rolling, been. rolling back the clock a bit here in game one myth. Now, uh, let's, let's talk about setting the pace for this grand finals. The Camelot Kings, they've played such a clean brand of smite. They have fallen behind at points throughout this tournament. But the Kings have been able to come back into those matchups regardless. All right, we're starting off already. We're right back to PVE as the green buff will drop. But, Miff, the question is, can the Titans get off to as good a start as we've seen other teams at this event get against the Kings? I'm not so certain. We've seen Sino on an arguably very early game pick with this Thanatos take a much more reserved pace throughout the first five, six, seven minutes. Seems like level eight to nine is that comfort point for Sino out of the jungle. Otherwise, though, look at every one of these side lanes. SOT on the tier, certainly capable of keeping up with Variety on this bully Mulan pick. And then Stu and Aurora, I mean, that is a kill lane through and through. If you get picked up by this Atlas, a heart bomb, I mean, that's a death sentence. Let's start with Big Stu here, Miff. What a tournament he has had for this Tartarus Titans team. That's right, and the crowd loves him. It's a player who has been solid. He's been average, not to mince words, for the Titans. However, this weekend, He's shown up, and he gets his, one of his best picks in game one. 
just high pressure, high rotation. That's been the main thing for Stu throughout this event. It's the willingness to leave lane. We talk about hunters. It's a meme in the community. We're not leaving until level 20. Not until I've got my my Rage Deathbringer, if you're an OG fan. Nowadays, like it's that the, way, yeah. the full tank shred build. But Stu's been rotating out around level 12, 13, getting involved in those mid 3v3s. He's over at the Pyromancer when his team needs him. The Greater Scorpion invades. He's been in a couple of those as well. So keep your eyes on Stu. When he leaves the Tartarus Titans, they love the Death Ball. Now, Miff, something whoa, whoa, you whoa, and whoa. I... Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, no! Oh, no, it's happened! Sot's been soloed! Massive. He's trolling in the solo lane. And how about the start from Variety on the Mulan? Aurora picks up Genetics. I told you, Heart Bomb, this could be big. Oh, no, this is where the Titans need to answer back. The Med will save the life of the Ymir. Fireworks in the first two minutes of the Grand Finals. And the one tangible lead now, Variety solos SOT. That is so early in the game, Dave. Variety, look at his build as well. He's itemizing to be that bully. He's looking towards Soul Leader in the first slot. That is the only opportunity this Mulan really could have had to take down Tier. And SOT drops it early on. That first blood means you're stacking earlier. Stacking earlier means you've got the ability to pressure out, proxy those waves, start working your way in towards the back camps. The bleed for the Camelot Kings, or on to the Tartarus Titans, rather, it might stem from the solo. Now, this is maybe 20 minutes from now. Do you, do you think Mulan's on a timer? I know we've had a lot of conversations around later on in the game, you know, can bully early, but lots of self-root going on in that kit. Is there a timer here for Variety? It depends on how he builds out. If he's got enough magical defense to survive a couple of rotations from Paul, then you're not so concerned. It seems to me it's going to be heal sustain, right? I'll, I'll be defensive by just regenerating HP and doing so so early. I, I think Mulan's in a pretty decent spot. And even the ability to chase out on Stu, I mean, I, I actually really like this pick into the Titans draft. Yeah, Sot's got to be careful here if Variety gets all those cooldowns back. Could be dangerous. Sino on the Thanatos here in game one. Mephit has taken over the Smite World Championships. Lots of conversations around it. Now, the conversation has also been that the Camelot Kings likely prepped silence on the big man. Tings crushing wave. It of doesn't hit, but Captain Twig doesn't have fear no evil. Paul a little more. gets a hammer drop. He's got his own. And it's Captain Twig back in. Sino to the wayside. Kings with another two. The Camelot Kings playing with all the momentum. The conversation around this team is they farm better. They grab every bit of the neutral, but so far, they have come out the gate swinging, and now it's not just Variety with a lead. Twig out of the jungle. I mean, this Hunbot, he's got great targets everywhere. Once that ultimate's back up, expect him to start bringing that winning right side center of the map over towards the duo. Now, Miff, before I was interrupted a minute ago by some fighting, we were talking about this Hebo while picks and bans were going on. Did you get the, the read, though, that it might have caught the Kings off guard? It's been pivotal to the Camelot Kings and their draft strategy this week. I mean, the, the priority order for the Tartarus Titans is just incredibly surprising. And we had seen even earlier in this event that Captain Twig was willing to go towards that Hebo and, uh, out of the jungle. It opens up Big Man Tings if he so chooses, look towards Assassins and Hunters. Uh, I think, who's really predicting a Hebo first pick? But if it surprised the Camelot Kings, it doesn't show because they've drafted well around it. Uh, the desk talks about it very well. Hazer brings up this Ymir pick for genetics. The lockdown potential, the ability to block out those crushing waves or even stop the telegraphed movement of a Hebo, that water carpet. I mean, yep. you're telling your enemy exactly where you're going. If genetics is on the ball, as he always is, it could make it very difficult for the Titans to maneuver. Variety, he wants another one here on SOT, maybe more damage and forcing this tier out of lane. Now, a mechanical matchup all throughout this grand finals from solo lane myth and eventually this tier should it not fall further behind is going to get strong enough to rotate into the fights and that's where we see sot he's got blink wants to be aggressive wants to make a statement in game one yeah the ability to just displace the entirety of the back line the, the slippery nature of this tier makes him so difficult to shut down in that mid to late game which is why this early drop for sot could be impactful glad shield not exactly the tankiest pickup and you're not even getting the full benefit of tier passive in this matchup. We talked about it earlier this weekend, but you can't CC tier, not for long, but if it's constantly Oof. applying, if Captain Twig's getting in there with Fear No Evil, SOT could struggle as well. Captain Twig wants to get in there with the Fear No Evil. It's been living on the Titan side of the jungle, Sot. Active now on a variety of the body box. Will allow Variety out the left side. Hold on, what? Twig, oh no! Sino took more than he bargained for. 
but SOT with He's ultimate about it. has Lawbringer, will not pull the trigger, not just yet. The blue buff won't be rotated towards Variety, still low as Sot. Gonna go for the play, Variety's eyeing him from over the wall. And Sot will keep it in the back pocket. Man, the damage output from this Mulan so early in this game, difficult to deal with. Sino tries to get up to the air, just not given the time. And that's with ultimates unexpended from the Camelot Kings. They hold on to both Captain Twig and Variety, know their damage output perfectly, and that keeps them strong. If SOT wants to stick around, had he felt like he could move in towards that blue buff, you can't anymore. Not with that threat of fear no evil. So instead, the Camelot Kings, they fall back. They take their admittedly massive wins so far, just seven minutes into the game, and reset it to neutral. I mean, Captain Twig, one of the most self-critical players throughout the year here in Season 9. Probably happy with the way that this tournament has gone so far. I've not dropped a game at the Smite World Championship. And a dream start Whew. for the Camelot King, Sot. Unhappy with the way his laning phase has gone up to this point. This is going to be an interesting battle myth. Throughout the rest of game one, Sino on the Thanatos myth off to an 0-2 start on a pick that you want to get aggressive on early, want to make a statement on in game one. Yeah, it's still, I, I think not falling too far behind, very important for Sino, so farming on map going to be significant here. Thanatos very whoa, good in this whoa. position. Paul, great ultimate. Needed. Avoids that from Captain Twig. Fear no evil. Can't apply with that CC immunity. We'll see if Aurora's is lucky. Oh, Aurora face plants into a wall from Genetics, and he's in trouble. There's plenty of damage, but it's all got to find its way over the wall. Who gets it? It's Genetics out of the duo lane. The Ymir has made its mark. The Camelot Kings have just picked apart the Titans on rotations, catching them in the jungle. I mean, the solo kill early on for Variety, sure. I think maybe the standout pick here, but otherwise, oh it's goodness. just maneuvering. Oh my goodness, Yark playing with some confidence now. Oh, he's got no Genetics. Old. Closing He's the gap, low. snipes are up, walls are there as well, freeze, all of it hits. The Camelot Kings are rolling. They are up six to zero in the first eight and a half minutes of game one. You wanted them to come out hot, and my God, they've done it. What an electric pace. I mean, even in the Jade Dragon set, we had seen them take the Camelot Kings play style, that slower, subdued, neutral farm. Now it's the Kings, Jazzberry jamming the Gold Fury. Gold Fury burnt through, and they've got plenty of confirm, and the Kings will get it. You didn't think their lead was big enough yet, but Stu, he's maybe got an got avenue beads. back in. Beads off of Yarkor, Genetics with the freeze. Gotta be one for the Taurus Titans, execute in. And it's the Titans on the board in game one. The, the Titans needed that, just to slow down the Camelot Kings, to see one go in, so important. And the kill allocation, I think, Good for the Tartarus Titans. Sino catches up a little bit there. Still has a slight hill to climb. 2-0 oh, and 2 for Captain Twig on the other side. Four of six affected kills. But itemization, the difference maker here. Jotun's for Sino. It's all about that hovering death. Whereas Twig, his eyes are on damage. Brawler's beat stick in first slot. This Hunbots has it. It's going to be a lot of burst. Captain Twig has been all over the map so far. That kill important for Sino to, to even up the level gap. SOT has maintained just this one level deficit so far throughout the laning phase, but Variety maintains a high level of pressure over on the right side. And how about that play, though, from, from Stuart and Aurora and the rest of the Titans? I mean, j just to see an early kill go in here in game one, especially when the other six have just been getting run against you, I think that shows communication and, and still some wherewithal and presence on the left side here in the first game, despite the rough start. And good fight back at that. Stu's ultimate there, just heat checking Yarkor, saying, hey, you might have got the Gold Fury, but we're gonna get some resources for it regardless. Stripping away the beads from this ROM creates openings for the Tartarus Titans. Now Sino might be looking towards that duo lane, but if the Camelot Kings keep pressure here, Whoa. I mean, how could you? Twig with a double fear, no evil, but he no follow-up from the rest of the Camelot Kings. Double pull in from Aurora! Oh, Sino! Sino with the shot back, Paul on a crushing wave! That's big! Oh my god! from Big Man Tings. SOT might just be the sacrifice, but Paul shoved aside. He's up. York misses two, hits three. Double kill from the ROM. Aurora, SmackDown, Kings flip the fight. It's two for three, favoring the Camelot Kings, but greater Scorpion taken by the Kings as well. Pyromancer looked at, and look at your map. Where are the Tartarus Titans? Nobody can rotate through. They've taken even more. The Titans so nearly turn around that fight big. Had Sino just got on the other side of the wall? Yeah. I mean, he's involved and he's in the mix, but instead, 
I, I don't know if he lands and Genex goes up the wall perfectly and catches landing and splits him up or just misplaces his own ultimate. Either way, the Camelot Kings, I mean, they are massive. Miff, are you, are you thinking the Titans were hoping for a 4,000 gold deficit 11 minutes into the first game of this set? 5,000 in experience. Wait, lane swap? What are you seeing here? Variety jumps over to left and battling with Stu for a little bit. Yark's here as well. So maybe just the idea of putting a little pressure there before heading back. Yeah, I, I think Variety TPs over towards dual lane, realizing Stu had kept up his pressure, just making sure those mini waves aren't being wasted to the tower, doesn't lose too much damage into his structure either. And then you've got the rotation from Yarkor over towards right, so he's allowed to stick around, clear out some of those waves. Not, not a true lane swap, just a, a momentary defense from the Camelot Kings. Paul, one three start for him, but an important crushing wave in the previous team fight. Feels like every single time that Fear No Evil has come off cooldown on the flip side of the jungle, Captain Twig has been using it somewhere. Nine kills on the board. However, Miff, nobody all that high in the kill participation department. A lot of it hovering around BMT with six. Feels like the Kings have sort of gently been applying their pressure everywhere. I mean, it's just spread wealth, right? I mean, everywhere on the map, the mm. Kimlock Kings finding small wins. SOT just off the mark with that blink. Had Variety gotten grabbed? Not exactly tanky just down. yet. I mean, two levels down, but you at least have Sino nearby, and it's not can we kill him, it's can we get him into execute threshold. Sure. Can we get him down to that 20, 30, 40%. Sino could do the rest. Instead, though, it's just a lost relic for the Tartarus Titans. And Variety, I mean, he's got too much healing. This Soul Eater, not answered just yet. He could fight Whoa. back here. Variety takes big burst of damage, but a fear no evil from over the wall. That might be enough from Twig to get his solo laner out of the fight. He'll leap away though, and Dangerous. Solos disengaged. Be to you though. Variety's gone back in. Got him. And Variety from over the wall. Look at Paul. Hits all of his abilities. Paul though gets a knock up on the big man Tings. Captain Twig Good left wall. running. Genetics on a wall. Slows down the Evo. Earthshaker it's crushes the mid laner. The roar tossed aside. And a killing spree for BMT. The Camelot Kings, have they been capable of this all year? This breakneck pace. The Tartarus Titans simply can't keep up. Genetics, oh. what was it that Neil Ma said? If you're playing annoying, that means you're playing right. Stops the back from Paul and makes sure that reset doesn't come through. Further creating opportunities for the Camelot Kings. Now a red buff goes their way as well. The Titans, they have to slow down this game. But even then, the deficit's so large. Yeah. Can you slow it down from here? I think you have to fight back now. You can't let the Kings pull further ahead. This is a speed blitz from the Camelot Kings. This, this is the type of game where you're looking at eight minutes from now, the Titans being looked at if they can keep things rolling here. Now, there's a lot of towers on the map, but I mean, you gotta, you gotta start looking towards late game here with this comp myth. Does, does the Titans composition even feel better if you're able to get to that 20, 30 minute mark, somehow keep this game alive. I mean, you've got Worlds Paul on Hebo. Yeah, of he, course, he might right. be able to do it you're on his own. You're feeling good about anything, right? Late game scaling pick, one shot potential, but I, I think it's more a question of how far away is late game. <laughs> Generally, it's 20, 25 minutes, but yeah. I mean, the Camelot Kings have done so well for themselves. They, they've effectively pushed back the Titans late game, maybe another 10, it, it could be 30, 40 minutes in, you're still waiting on items. I mean, look at the builds. There's such large disparities there, and it's only going to get worse. This is a smart trade. Titans, man, they won't even consider the steal. The Camelot Kings group. Wait. Oh, they're not considering the steal. They're not considering the steal because they're considering the fire giant. It. Variety's they can't here, do it. But the Tartarus Titans immediately leave. They do. Stun not in from Variety. And the Mulan reads the play. Does that feel like desperation to you here, Myth, for the Tartarus Titans? It's just a good call. You got to heat check the Camelot Kings, but if Variety keeps locking them down, the rotation's in. Oh, my! Big Man Tings presses delete on top of a roar, and it's a stun from Variety. Sino's in. He'll get another. Got him. SOT. Sino with nothing left to fight for. Camelot Kings drop another three, and they're doubling back to the fire pit. Fire Giant gonna go easily to the Camelot Kings, the only one anywhere nearby to defend. Stu, no way he makes the rotation in. Paul just now crossing that mid threshold. I love the call for the Fire Giant. Tartarus yeah. Titans, you have to go for it. You know the Camelot Kings are on gold. You just don't have the damage output for it. Variety playing very fast there. I, I would have been surprised if I'm the Titans. Why is Variety here? How do you get here so quickly? Just separates the fight, keeps the Titans there and the Kings rotate through and make it look so, so simple. But can we talk about Big Man Tings for just a moment? 
these earth shakers. They have to, right? The, you, they haven't missed. No. This, this guy is just clicking heads, bro. It, it is ridiculous. Think about the Kings, though, and, and before this team could all get to NA, all get to Georgia, all play together. What styles of comps were they playing? It's the same exact stuff that, that right. feels like it could be in meta right now. It's genetics on something like the Ymir. The walls are always going to be on point. Even the slows from the ultimate, the freezes have been fantastic. And big man Tings, with assistance, has been hitting everything. But I think even without, has looked fantastic so far this game. And a big man Tings that's starting to spool up early in what could be a long set always bodes well for the Camelot Kings. And Key Paul a bit further behind. It's pretty telling when only Stu is ahead of the support on the other team. That's big. Stu loses his beads. Whew. Continued pressure from Variety and the snipes from Yarkor as well. Can make a tier one tower for the Camelot Kings. The Tartarus Titan's probably smart not to rotate left. I don't think you defend tier ones. You might be willing to soft defend tier two, but I, I like this much better from the Tartarus Titans. We don't love our odds in a base defense. You don't have a, a standard mage to keep these minion waves out, so instead split push, collect gold, and then get back to your Phoenix. But has it taken them too long? Wow. The Tartarus Titans, they're not here. <laughs> I said I said 22 minute base breaking type plays from the Camelot Kings, but they're looking at it at 17 and a half. Still a lot of time left on this FG though. A couple towers left to grab. Feels like setup. And you're gonna further extend out that gold lead, and it's desperation time, Miff, already. Early on in the SWC Finals, Titans just got ran out here in game one and did not have many answers. This is mistake on mistake on mistake needed from the Camelot Kings to get the Titans back in. It would take a pretty significant blunder from this position. The Tartars Titans, though, a team that will force you to answer correctly. They will force you to play well, and if you don't, they can punish you. Keep your eyes on Paul. He hasn't gone for his signature Blink Hebo one shot. Instead, <laughs> beats Aegis Man. for a bit of safety here. And I think you have to. Every single member of the Camelot Kings is a threat. When the support is the same level as your mid laner, on the other side, genetics 15 to Paul's 15, how can you fight back in? Variety took barely any damage from Paul there. It's a matter of time. Trebuchet, we saw some of these plays early in season nine. Slow it down, let the Trebuchet deal a lot of damage, force the Titans out if they want to keep this left, left Phoenix alive, or maybe Variety stepping forward, looking for an initiation of his own. Ultimate, it's up from a roar, <laughs> just backed away from by the Kings. This trebuchet might just take down the left side Phoenix all on its own. A little bit of damage needed, a little bit of damage dealt, and the Kings break the base of the Titans at 19 minutes. It, it doesn't look great for the Titans there, but if it's one pick, if it's two picks, that potentially is the game. So in just slowing down the Camelot Kings, keeping their Phoenix alive as long as they had. May have bought an opportunity and another couple of minutes while the Fire Giant respawns. The Camelot Kings seem pretty content with just taking down the one bird. Tier two still standing on right, could be where the Camelot Kings go next. They've got enough of a lead, they don't need to wait for Fire Giant to push in there. Instead, reset, spend up your gold, get ready, and you control the rotations of the Tartarus Titans. I wonder though, it's so difficult for them to defend that left side wave. SOT not going for teleport means he needs to be around the fire giant if he wants to get involved in that team fight. Anyone who shows himself on that left hand side really just has a long rotation path over towards the fire. Maybe best person would be Sino. Has that scent of death, the second ability. If anyone drops low from the Camelot Kings, which sounds like a long <laughs> shot right now. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen a half speed. HP bar in a little while. It might be Sino stepping forward. Three levels down, his jungle counterpart. Feels like one of those games that's just sort of gone sideways from the very beginning. I mean, Variety gets a solo kill on the SOT just a couple minutes into the laning phase. Captain Twig playing in the Titan side of the jungle on his Hunbats. One of his favorite picks have really set the pace. Now, both teams on the left side of the map here. Titans looking like they're going to channel their backs now. Oni Fury, it'll get picked up by the Camelot Kings. It'll drop. It'll open up some pressure in mid and right. Fire minions, fire Oni minions on the left side, right as this FG is about to respawn. Dire straits for the Titans at the 20 minute mark. I like that from the Kings. You, you'd expect them to just go ahead, set up on Fire Giant, get ready for Pyro, you know, the, the standard instead. If the Tartarus Titans made the decision of, well, it's pretty clear that they're going for Fire, or at least they will eventually. Let's push into this tier one on left, or maybe grab this Fury. The Camelot Kings would have been there to jump on them. The Titans, though, good game sense. 
realize the kings are hovering in the wings and back themselves up. Fire Giant, easy. It's easy. The least contested Fire Giant you may be seeing all weekend long, and it goes to the kings. Now, if the Titans are a creative team, not only in drafting, but in some of their shot calling in game. Unfortunately, in a moment like this, if you're not gonna defend your base, you gotta do something creative, whether it's a roundabout play through mid, try to shove down the jungle, or maybe you're just hoping that there's a mistake made by someone on the Camelot Kings. You've got a bit of damage built up, but the Relic situation just fine for the Kings. None of their carries concerned, none of the team concerned. And then it's a simple right side bird for the Kings, now forcing a split base defense from the Titans. And still so much time on this fire, the Camelot Kings. I mean, they, they could just stroll in now. I mean, take your time, collect as much farm as you want, could even back up, grab the Pyromancer, additional movement speed out of base, buy some wards, keep it simple. The Tartarus Titans, I Man. mean, it's such a steep hill. What is that, 18,000? Yep. You do the math for me. Yeah, 18,000. You that's, got it. That's too Never much. Never second guess yourself, buddy. It, it You're is, good at math. It's too much at this point. I mean, the Tartarus Titans, they've got comeback mechanics. Execute always good. Yep. It doesn't matter if Thanatos can't do the actual damage. You're, re you're relying on Stuart. You're, you're relying on Paul for situations like that. But just grabbing that one kill could be a way in. And if the, the Camelot Kings continue to play this steady pace, if they don't want to leave it up to any form of risk, we've seen them back up in situations like this. Where did this game go sideways for the Titans in your mind? I mean, it was early solo kill from Variety. I, I think that was like 45 seconds in, <laughs> right. Variety dies, and then 30 the seconds sideways, later, right. two more people die. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was early. Do you feel like it's just well-funneled pressure from, from Twig and, and knowing exactly where to apply it throughout game one? Counter ganks on a Sino as well. I mean, it's that rotation from Sino over towards right that Twig really shuts down. I mean, this one, it got out of control so fast that I, I, I think the Tartarus Titans Probably not too upset about it, but still certainly would love to find right. a dub here. Well, maybe one more opportunity for the Titans on base defense. Again, Variety takes a full rotation and doesn't lose much of his HP, though Stewart has. He's half in the back. Captain Twig, though, if he's used some of his initiation early in the fight. He has, and not a whole lot of value from it. Does have a bit of CDR in the build, so should be able to get it back up before too long. Instead, it's left side Phoenix on respawn, Twig. I'm sure he still likes his odds in a 1v1 here. Yeah, even without his ultimate. Sino, though, can rotate over to mid, make an impact there if need be. Right side fire minions, they'll catch up here eventually. Paul has been dealing with them so far, while Captain Twig searching for the last bit of damage on the left side Phoenix. Those fire minions now gone. Seems like just once that door opens, and it's open now, the mid Phoenix is gone. Variety is going to get pulled back in. Fire Ooh, that roar, wall? the wall up from Genetics. This time the Earthshaker. Doesn't quite hit its target, but the Kings, if they've got what they came for, all three Phoenixes down. Paul dropped low, ultimate not quite there, should be able to reset. That is an inhuman wall from Genetics. Yep. I cannot tell you how difficult it is to separate Tear from someone who is already in the Fearless. I mean, if Variety goes much further back there, could potentially lose his life, considering the ultimate down. Instead, Genetics, I mean, he's just giving him a second life. Myth, we are 25 minutes into game number one. The Titans have had no leg to stand on throughout it. And they'll end with that one. The Kings, they're going to strike first blood in the grand final. Just clinical from the Camelot Kings. It starts early and it ends early. An emphatic oh statement match. Oh genetics, look at him. A statement from Genetics. Eyes down on the keyboard from the Tartarus Titans. I'm not sure if they saw what Genetics was saying, but he was questioning a lot of things and a lot of decisions. I mean, if I don't, I know we had an S, we had a Smite World Championship bingo card. I don't know if 24 minute blitz game number one from the Kings was on mine. No, I, I don't think it was, but it should have been. Uh, go ahead and mark it if it is. That was a very clear game. I mean, it, clinical from minute one to minute done. The Tartarus Titans, I think, can at least rest on the fact that. It happened so fast, it got out of control so early that it's not a lot of mistakes in the mid game. It's not a lot of mistakes in the late game. If you can clean up just the first five, 10 minutes, you give yourselves a much better shot. My goodness, what a statement from the Camelot Kings. Now the most important game of the set, Miff. That's game right. number two, it's coming up next. We'll see if the Titans can bounce back. Wait, that's not right. This. Wait, wait. It is right.
never should have kissed you. I never should have done That girl I swear I pull the reason Run, run, girl Trying to make this all I'm done Done, girl I never should have kissed you I, I never should have gone there I know that there's a problem What the problem And I know that it would kill me Could, could kill me But I can't resist I'm falling Fall, falling And I know that this will burn me Burn, burn, burn Cause I'm playing with Game one finishes, and the Kings stand tall after that one. A fast game on pace uh, for one we saw yesterday. The Dragons able to win one like that over the Titans, but weren't able to get the set, so maybe we'll see something back from the Titans. If we're talking adjustments, I've come to trust them there. Oh, yeah. But one thing that we have been seeing, we've been talking about over the, the last couple of weeks, and this is actually going to go for anyone who's in the crowd, anyone watching at home, uh, we have an amateur tournament that is going to be coming up. It's a partnership that we have with the Smite Amateur League. It is the SALT tournament, first annual Smite Amateur League tournament. That prize pool, the amount of zeros you see on there is correct. 200,000 gems January 27th at, uh, sorry, starting at January 28th at 10 a.m as it has been moved, and then again on the, the day afterward. Uh, the broadcast is going to follow about two, afters each, or two hours after each stage of the tournament. We will be showcasing a lot, and it's going to be done in studio in Alpharetta. So if you want to get featured on the broadcast, you want to showcase what you have, go ahead and sign up to play for the tournament. Again, 200,000 gym prize pool, as well as the Salt Champ Avatar. Semifinals, finals are guaranteed to be broadcasted, but some other random games will be as well. So if you're just playing around, you happen to be in the tournament, you might get featured on the broadcast. Speaking of featured on the broadcast, you can get featured as well right now by tweeting at us with hashtag worlds with fans. Whether you're getting pictures with Dave's family, as you can see it there, the Bengals jersey, or sorry, I guess in this case, just the jacket, standing proud. Or if you're watching at home, with, of course, all the furry friends out there as well. Not just any furry friend. That was Ramsey specifically, Dave's dog. So many dog. Olsons. Uh, a lot of Olsons that are coming in. Uh, the Loki dad as well watching. And I believe I saw some very sad thunder sticks that are no longer thundering anymore. The hand's going to have to stand up. Lady Rebellion out there. And, of course, the, uh, the two who have been mistaken for others throughout the weekend, Jordan and Lewis, Cam16, tweeting it out. And pairing each other with a couple of their <laughs> tweets here uh, and making sure that everything is fun there still in the back room. But of course, however you're watching, whether it is here in the studio and the venue, I'm so used to saying studio, Charlie, yep. uh, or if you are watching at home, make sure that you're tweeting at us, hashtag worlds with fans to get featured on broadcast. Now to go uh, even the next step further, 
First Blood, explosive start for a final set variety. Able to find anything, of course. Our First Blood or First Pug replay is brought to you by MillionPugs.com and their Scotty Pug mascot. Million Pugs rewards you in Smite loot when you make purchases online. You can learn more about Million Pugs uh, from the links, well, one, just by going to MillionPugs.com or finding their bio and following them there. And Trelly, first off, welcome back, man. And second, that's the way you want to start a Mulan oh, yeah. game, man. I mean, it's a very clutch timing. Variety knew his levels very well. He was saying, hey, one more minion and you're gone. So it was like, surely he's level two for at least a yeah. couple more minions. And right when you get access to that grapple, he doesn't miss, especially not on the world stage. Hurry, you seemed something uh, about the first blood maybe stood out to you? Yeah, that is a problem character to get an early kill, I think, in the Mulan. That's where she succeeds already, and enabling her to kind of get that passive stacked up sooner, upgrade those abilities earlier on in the game, is when she truly becomes a problem. I mean, outside of that first blood, we kind of just saw a mistake in mid as well, so kind of everything seemed to fall apart for the Titans across the board. It, it is a little bit to no surprise, in my opinion, for what picks the Kings kind of got that game, getting the soul lane matchup they want to, which is evident in that first blood that we just talked about. Um, but yeah, the Mulan was definitely a really huge pick for the Kings. It has been a huge pick for them as of late too, especially if you can get it late in the draft. So we'll have to see how the Titans do, uh, do adjust to that. What do you think about how they adjust here in fall? Yeah, I mean, maybe you just want to switch sides and give Salt the counter pick game confident. If there was if there was a team I thought were going to go into this nervy, I would have thought the Kings. I mean, the Titans just came through a game five slobber jammer in, the, in, the, in their semifinal. <laughs> it was a huge matchup they played through. They played in in front of the loud crowd, but it seemed that they started this one off a little bit nervous. Early mistakes for them snowball into a huge lead for the Kings. And the Kings, they don't make big mistakes. That's what they're known for. They play consistent and they run the game all the way to the finish. I don't know. I, again, not professional lip reader here, but I do think at least one phrase there from genetics was, what are they doing? Yep. Uh, standing up confidence, maybe showing why they're the Kings. We'll see what they can continue as we you know, eventually move forward. Games two, game three. I'm certain we're going to see some adjustments here, though, Charlie, from, from the Titans. But things that, that stand out to me, uh, you know, it, it starts out, first off, when, when you get Tings, who's going 4-0-7. Oh, We've talked about this in the past. When you look at Harkor, who's gone 3-0-4, oh, if your carries are undying, Charlie. Yeah. You've got some problems, and you've got them all over the place. We already mentioned the Mulan. That Ymir, those walls were so important throughout that game and it, it almost made easy by the Titans. It, it seems to me like the gen genetics is feeling himself as he has been throughout the entirety of this tournament and uh, at the end of that game you saw the pop off right he it, it's just that ego and it's not yeah. going to stop it's being fed by these plays he's making he's got the follow up if you know BMT is going to follow you up with a massive earth shaker max range and he's not going to miss any single time you know your carry is going to be popping off you can play the way you want the Kings are looking real hot but as you said I think the Tartarus Titans can back it up make some adjustments, try and stop the momentum before it gets rolling even harder. Are you feeling the same way? I mean, the Vulcan was 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 massive. There were a lot of problem picks that game, Gore. We, uh, I think the Vulcan was a problem. <laughs> yeah, I think the Mir was a problem. Kings. I think the, yeah, I mean, I think the Mulan was a problem. I think even the Rama was a problem. So, I, I mean, honestly, I think the whole Kings draft felt like a problem, but part of that may just be that lead that they got off to. Yeah. If I'm the Titans, I have a couple of options in this next draft. It's run it back and ban away some more of those problem picks. Leave open the, you know, top pick hunters. Don't worry about banning those. Ban away their comfort picks. Maybe, I mean, honestly, I would probably pick out the Vulcan, maybe the Ymir if I had to. And then I would just clear my head, focus on the early game, make sure we don't have those early deaths, and, and don't overreact. I think that's probably what, if I'm on the Titans, I would elect for. Yeah. But we'll just have to see what they do when we get in there. Well, I've got good news. We can get in there right now. Picks and bans for game number two. Coming at you, Titans first pick again. Gonna have to see what kind of adjustments the team comes up with. Uh, Hazer, uh, you know, we're talking about it. First off, hurry, I'm, I'm sorry for you. The Kernanos Bad news. Uh, is getting banned out there. Hazer, just a little room for it, but with the Ama ban that we saw last time, again, the control the Kings had over a few very key, crucial, specific picks. Uh, it was a very 
dominating picks and bans from yeah, the games absolutely. that we saw in the game. Do you feel like they're they're on track to do the same thing? Well, right now we're seeing the same picks and bans so far, right? Mm -hmm. If this is followed up by an Ishtar, which is not, we do see an adjustment come through. The Ymir identified as a problem. Those walls were so. I think I saw a tier fearless get interrupted yeah. with a wall in between him and who he was fearlessing, which I've never done. I don't know if Genetics is just doing that on the regular, but Ishtar not banned out this time by the Titans and will be first picked over the Hebo. Yeah, there's the Hebo takeaway. This is, I think, the King's plan for this, in case this was how the picks and bans went down. I think it's smart. Both teams do prioritize Hebo quite highly. Uh, no surprise to see that locked in for the Kings. Probably going to be going to Twig, if I had to guess, so that means maybe a double Hunter draft coming out of the Kings potentially here. We'll have to see how in what direction they go there. If yeah. I am the Titans right now, though, in these next two picks, what I want to do is I want to get Aurora on something he's a little this more comfortable on. I don't want to see the Atlas again. Nope. Sylvanas has been getting banned away. I'd be happy to see that. Maybe it's not the best Ares game. I'd be happy to see that, too. Maybe it's a better Ares game. But if I'm the Titans right now, I'd like to go pick Aurora forth, something. Tiamat hasn't been picked yet, obviously, yeah. into the Hebo last game. Not too upset to see the Tiamat for Paul. It did overperform, I think, in the semifinals previous to this set. Uh, I'm a little worried about Aurora's God Pool, but we'll have to see what he likes to go after the ban phase. Especially some of the bans that we've seen, second phase for the, the Kings has been targeted towards that role. Uh, it's been four games, I believe, Atlas has played this tournament, and four big old losses that he has met. Uh, not exactly the way you would expect it. And whether you want to fault him for it, fault things around him, I mean, there's one common denominator in every single one of those games. And after a while, maybe you have to leave it towards the wayside. Hebo, Rom, though, you know, we've done a lot of talking about the Titans. Shelly, as a top two, you get one pick that was just a problem. Yep. And you get one pick that we know can be a problem. And because they banned out the Ymir, they don't get that same sanctity of just like, oh, cool, we can just block you off. And with no Odin, especially considering it's only on the walls, or sorry, on the ult, it really limits the, the maybe quote-unquote counterplay. Yeah, it does, but when I look at the Kings' top two, two very hard carries. You know, Rama can run away with the game. Yeah. It is going to Yark, and he has been on point with those snipes, as we just saw in the highlights, Oh yeah. as well as if this is, again, Captain Twig taking the Hebo into the jungle, which he's been apt to do at times. It, it has a pretty decent matchup in the Thantos. As long as you're able to get online a bit earlier, as long as you save Crushing Wave for that hovering death, if you're taking that 1v1, you can even knock him up out of the Soul Reap before it gets fully cast. You don't get silenced. And it looks like the Terra is going to be the pick there. Plenty of setup. It, it pretty much forces the enemy team into building tons of anti-heal because you don't want to deal with how much sustain this Terra brings. Uh, it, it's really nasty trying to P and B against the Camelot Kings. They just have such good game minds for the game. Well, I know Kings fans have a reason to have been cheering with the 1-0 victory. The Titans looking a little deathly serious. Maybe need a little support. For those of you who are out there, the Titans Maybe needing the energy of the crowd more than ever. Again, they, they've argued about it even slightly at the end there. There's the cheers. Get the morale up. Game number two, game one. There's been an argument for, I feel like, three full years <laughs> as to which one is the one that is higher priority. Bands that are coming through, Aries taking away, hurry. But on the other, we finally get to identify one specific problem. The Mulan stripped away this time. They won't be able to go back to it. I think taking away the Mulan makes sense. Maybe it makes Sot feel a little bit more comfortable to go back to the tier, which I do think he wanted last game. Unfortunately, off to a bad start. I think he'd feel a lot more comfortable not having to play against that Mulan, so yeah. that makes sense as a bottom two band to me for the Titans. I think they have a lot of options. They do elect for the Danza Burrow, so they are expecting the double hunter composition to be coming out of the Kings as well, which I think is a good call out, especially seeing that Hebo. Hebo and Terra can definitely carry the magical damage for the Kings. It's not necessary for them to go a mage in mid here. And I do expect, once again, this to be a Hebo jungle. No surprise to see that. We do know it's Twig, and it's one of his favorite picks. So I expect them to go there. Uh, Aurora, I do want to talk again about his pick. We haven't seen it yet. I do think the Atlas looks particularly bad here, especially into the Terra. I think that's a bad matchup for him. What's left open now with the Cabracken gone, with the Ares gone, is the Sylvanas that people have been banning away. Yeah. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to, to see him play that pick. I think it slots in well for what the Titans are looking to do here. Gives them a great duel. Two souls hit. Perhaps you think, go for it. Ooh. Wow. You called it. I mean, you've been looking for the double hunter the whole time, Hurry. Izanami is what gets locked in. Uh, Hazer, something occurred to me, though. While, while Hurry was talking about that, and it was specifically, you know, seeing Hebo go into the jungle. Very different 
than what a Hunbats provides, right? Yes, they both got the H at the beginning, but that's about where the similarities <laughs> end. I mean, Team Fight Ultimates, you've got bigger burst, but you've got less CC. It feels like this is a pick, uh, Hazer, could, could really change a lot for the Kings, and, and it can either be very positive or very negative. Yeah, only HB gods for Captain Twig. Um, Hebo, <laughs> he does something similar to Humbats in a way, in that he allows you to lock down immobile frontliners really, really well. Yeah. That water spout is so powerful for setting up for your double hunter comp to follow up and just absolutely arrow down tanks. Get all of your damage into them in a knockup, and it's ranged as well, so he can set it up from far back and let his team follow up on that, and it really allows for some great CC chains, which the Kings, I feel like, they're really prone to, to preferring comps that can go that yeah. way. Shelly, he's an Ami. Yep. You said wow when you saw it locked in. Not someone we're used to seeing as of late. It's interesting because I think Iza could sure rise up a little bit more Ooh. as the Koopa gets locked in. Wow. I mean, that's an incredible amount of CC setup. But also, you can put yourself out pretty easily if you ever use that throwback to, to clear the wave or go for some damage. You use your only, your only escape. There's plenty of annoyance that comes from this Kumba Karna pick, though. Burning beads becomes extremely easy. If you can time it well, you know Terra's about to dash into her monolith. You just mess her out. She doesn't get break it. She doesn't get that CC. And also, she doesn't get that reset, her second yeah. dash. But to the point of the Iza, I think has a very good matchup into Ishtar. Even an Ishtar Sylvanas lane can get out cleared if the Izanami is playing properly and goes up and just starts power clearing. However, a very telegraphed gank as well. If, if Sino decides to get Erendite on this Thanatos, can really reveal her when she dashes out, and yeah. you can follow that so easily. I I'm thinking positioning is going to have to be clear here for these. New labor. Oof, I wanted, hurry, I wanted so badly to ask about the Kumba because we heard a lot about it uh, when going against the, the auto attackers. But also now there's a Hercules on the screen, someone we don't get often. No. What does it bring to the solo lane? Why, why is it locked in here of all places? I think Variety wanted a warrior. I think they were sure that they wanted a warrior. My guess is they were probably thinking about Tyr. If it wasn't the Hercules, maybe Tyr doesn't look the best into what they have. Maybe he doesn't like it into the Osiris matchup. Yeah. So he was fishing for another warrior that kind of fit the bill for what they were looking for this game. Variety has been practicing this Hercules. We know he's capable. It's a high execution oh, yeah. character. Uh, it makes the Osiris have to be careful about camping the tower because he can easily get pulled in. You can get easy first floods. We saw it happen last game. Mm -hmm. Maybe foreboding that it may happen again. Hercules <laughs> is the king of getting those early kills. Uh, I think it's a it's a cool pick to pick as well early in the in the finals as well, and I think it could pay off for them. I do think we should talk about the Kumbo before we have time going to go in. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and give their thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. I mean. We talk about Aurora, he loves to be annoying. Is yeah. Kumba the most annoying character in the game? I would say so. <laughs> Definitely one of them. <laughs> Has that Mez to reduce the attack speed of the double hunters as well and set up for the team. Got to be looking to peel for Paul and hopefully able to take this team to a win. I'm excited to see what they have. The Titans, they're only down one and it's a best of five. So we can find out right now if they can tie things up or if the Kings will take a 2-0 lead without sticking around the desk any longer. We're going to jump up to the casters for game number two. Thank you kindly, Desk Miff. It, it heated up a bit here after game one. Are you are you comfortable? No, I, it, it is I very hot up here. I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. I think it's time for no. the suspenders to, to pop off. Come on, dude. Does anyone down there need a pair you of suspenders? Would... Does anyone down there want? Here, I'll bag them up. Dave. Get ready, they're coming. There's metal in oh, the Oh, shit. Oh, God. 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 Yes! <laughs> Sorry, I swore on cast. <laughs> Who got him? Did Thor get him? Oh, you got the suspenders. They're off now, Myth. We have heated up in the grand finals. Oh, you got a belt. Okay. I got good. a belt on. Okay, Don't worry. We're, 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 all, we're all put together. It's all good. Whoever got the plastic bag that the suspenders were in, you're that, welcome. Yo, that's two prizes now. Two prizes. The plastic bag is secondary prize. Let's talk about that. I cannot believe you. Oh, I love you, buddy. Let's talk about the grand finals here, though. The, the Camelot Kings run over the Titans in game number one. And now it's time in game number two of the Smite World Championship grand finals for the Tartarus Titans to pick it up, to build some momentum. And Myth, maybe they've got a comp that can fight back. I mean... Early game, you're really looking towards the solo lane. Uh, you've got pressure from Ishtar, but Aurora generally going to be playing a more facilitator role in this Kumakarna. Could try and lock down individual targets. Trelly brings up the, the interaction point of Terra. Very telegraphed where she wants to dash. You can catch it, make sure that you're not getting through that monolith. But 
when you look at mid, Tiamat is not a pick that has pressure. Tiamat is not a pick that, that you're looking for the first five, six, seven levels to get active. It's much more late mid to, to just straight up late game slanted. We've seen Sino slow down his pace out of the jungle. I want to see him get active early on, maybe even towards that soul lane if Variety is feeling himself after game one. And how could you not be yep. with such an emphatic start? Could catch him unawares. Otherwise, for the Camelot Kings, it's different. Anytime you draft double hunter, it's pressure. That, that's what you've done it for. And both high pressure picks, piercing auto attacks in both lanes, means that the Camelot Kings can rely on these laners on their own to hold their own and allow Captain Twig to start spooling up in the jungle. Man, this Aurora pick. What, what a crazy pick to bring out in a game two to, to steady the ship. And I think that that's the mindset that Aurora's got to have here, a leader for this team. He'll play Kumba Karna, not only to control that lane, but hopefully match some of the pressure that Genetics has got. It's a level two for Yarkor. But pressure, Gore, up against an Izanami and a Terra, you gotta find it. Uh, no. <laughs> Izanami's just so good at pushing out those waves, man. I mean, Charlie brought it up even then uh, against an Ishtar and a Yomoji together, so maybe the highest pressure Guardian you're probably still favoring Izanami and her ability to just get those minion waves into the enemy tower. It's very difficult to fight in. The weakness of Izanami is PvP in the early game. You're not really putting up the same amount of DPS as any other hunter's auto attacks because they're disjointed on that go forth and come back. Unless you've got that first ability available, Yarkor, not quite yet, has elected to go towards the dash in second slot means if the Tartar Titans wanted to get aggressive in this lane, now would be one of the best times to do it because you're just not worried about that fight back from Yark. Right. And that window's gone. He's level three. Unlucky. Real small window there. Look, it, it feels like the Titans just simply have too much talent here, and we've seen too much momentum from this team to have repeats of what we got in game number one. That said, the Kings, they have dominated their opponents so far here this weekend, Niff. And if they are able to run back a game two win here, reverse sweep of epic proportions needed. A twig on this Hebo certainly changes that dynamic. But how about the solo lane matchup? Variety's got Herc here in game number two. We saw it a bit during the qualifier weekend last weekend, Miff. Not, not thinking I was expecting it here on the main stage. No, I mean, but it was Ducky playing and it looks good. Whoa. Twig though, are you good? Is this the start the Titans good need? Knockout. Oh, double knock up. He's from out. Twig, and what a play from the Hebo. But it's a blue buff invade on a pull back from Sino. He shoved right back towards Captain Twig. But I'm not sure the Titans going to give up their blue buff siege just yet. Cooldowns will be back up. Blue buff dropped by the Tartarus Titans. And a little bit of value on the right side rotation. That's what you want to see if you're a Tartarus Titans fan. That pressure around the soul lane. One of the best places to find it. The ability to keep variety on the back foot. So important. Hercules, a pick that can really disrupt that back line. Really has great non-committal initiation. And high healing potential. If he establishes a lead, so difficult to shut him down. So SOT Sino, they can proactive and nipping it right in the bud. Stewart. And lights out so far throughout the Smite World Championship. Built up a large fan base throughout the course of the last couple of games. Fan favorite for sure. And they'll want something out of this Ishtar here this game. Ishtar has remained top pick, top ban all throughout the Smite World Championships in Season 9. Plenty of late game scaling to be had there. And so early pressure, the only, the only early indications we have here, Miff, are on the right side of the map from the Titans, Sino, Sot, maybe feeling like that's an area where they have an early advantage. And, and I want to see the Titans keep playing there because if the map starts to move or the, the action starts to move towards the center of the map, Paul just can't hang with Big Man Tings. Not this early on, not against this Hunter, not with Tiamat. So in creating pressure on the right, the Tartar Titans allow Paul to farm up a little bit more. Aurora's gonna play very safely as well, could just rotate through, make sure Paul's feeling all right. Stu, I think you could trust him to hold his own in lane. Once we start to get ADC 1v1s, once the Hunters are left alone, supports generally don't rotate back too often, I think that's where Stu's gonna feel a little bit more comfortable. Yarkor, one of the most aggressive Hunter players in the league, still not on a pick that, that essentially facilitates that style. Whereas Stu, Ishtar, I mean, do I need to sing her praises? We've seen her ad nauseum during this event. 
She'll just be able to hold her own, and even then, with a slight disadvantage, could likely still turn around. Heck, we've been getting cheers whenever the Ishtar finally ends up getting banned away. But far too lucrative of a pick to take away or, or to not pick up from Stewart here. It's like Scepter dropped there by a roar. So a small win again for the Tartarus Titans on the left side of the map. Looks like no repeat blue buff gank on the right. And Variety will pick it up just fine. What's the power curve of this Hercules like? Of course, we love dominating uh, uh, early game ganks. You can maybe find some control there. We saw Ducky have some great late game base defense uh, attempts on the Hercules last weekend. What are you looking for variety at different points throughout this game? You know, Hercules is one of those picks where, where I think his kit is so strong in of itself that you're not even looking towards itemization. If execution is good, a level three Hercules at the 40 minute mark could really disrupt your team fight just with the, the ability to displace your enemies. So power curve, as long as he's executing well, Variety's, I mean, he, he's there. Uh, the only thing that becomes more difficult is the amount of healing he gets. That third ability can really mess with the mental arithmetic that Sino has to do with that execute threshold. If you're going up in the air assuming that Variety's about to fall on a threshold, and then he gets a massive burst of healing, you essentially waste your ultimate. So keep your eyes on Sino, keep your eyes on Variety. That's an interaction I think that could really shake up some of these team fights. Miff, do you think you'd ever get into coaching? Do you think you'd be a good coach? No, I've, I've got no patience, and I'm bad. Well, humor me, if you will, after what could be a fight here between Sino and Twig. Blue buff not back up and respawning yet, so this is just fighting for fighting's sake. Now, I will ask you to humor me. You're the coach of the Titans. Somehow you guys have made it to the grand finals. What are you telling your team after game one? Do you need a, just a slow game in game two, or do you go the other direction? Do you pick up the pace and try to shove back the Kings? Uh, I think first and foremost, pep talk, right? Game one was pretty tough. I, I want to make sure my boys' mentals are back in it. After that, it's play your own game. Trust the strategies you devised. Trust the practice that you've had up until this point, and, and don't change anything. Don't adjust to the pace of the Camelot Kings. Keep playing your own Whoa. style. Said we might see. AD carry 1v1. Stewart obviously has Scepter here, so he's felt okay in lane for the last couple of minutes. Stun on to Paul. Big Man Ting's close by as well. A double AD carry composition for the Kings. And so to really get threatening, Miff, in the next 10 or so minutes when the objective, the first rotation of objectives is around, you got a few items on those hunters. And it's if the Titans can answer the call, answer the burn that we know the Kings will have. Yeah, hunters aren't hunters until second item. Until then, they're just there to clear waves and, and maybe poke out against each other. Right. We'll get to see which one of the two between Big Man Tings and Yarkor. I like to go down that crit tree. Very often when there's a double hunter comp, at least one of them is picking up Shadow Steel in first slot. Generally, it's either Kin Size or Executioner for the other. I imagine we'll see the power stack for Big Man Tings that would leave your core in a position to look towards crit. Uh -oh. SOT, you good? And Saad died for first blood. Ooh, that's tough. In game one, we'll narrowly avoid a pullback in the soul lane. Can Stuart do the same? Backflips away from Genetics. Alts are down, but Stu has hit no stunts. He lives. Needs one more. Stu lives. Oh, Nava Yark on the fadeaway. He'll hit the shot. And the Kings will find first blood yet again. One of the main strengths of Izanami is that minions cannot body block those auto attacks. They are piercing. Stu tries to get into that minion wave, and Yark makes sure he pays for it. Love that aggressive play. Genetics as well, that Urban Fury, the second uh -oh. that he hits that oh, dash. Man. Sino. Oh, man, is it happening Tings. again? Big man Tings over from mid, drops snipes onto Sino. Miff, it's a run back of exactly what we saw in game one an early first blood in one of the side lanes, and then a jungle scrap that gives a second kill over. Within a 30 second time frame yep. at that, I mean, I, I am loving this, this new look at the Camelot Kings, just aggression on board, catch them rotating through the jungle. I mean, that was a tried and true, just dual lane scuffle, I, I suppose, but otherwise, it's Captain Twig who has stepped up here in the grand finals. We did get a small look at an interaction for the Camelot Kings in the soul lane where we saw a variety and Captain Twig try and jump onto SOT. If those knockups are used simultaneously, Variety's loses out. Hebo's knockup has priority over Hercules. So if they're not communicating properly around those abilities, it makes it very difficult for Variety to actually find the pull. Variety, some damage dealt from SOT. Where Sino? Oh, but just now out of execute threshold. Said Sino drops. On the Captain Twig, the fadeaway shot from Sot won't hit either. Narrowest of margins. 
The twig and variety will remain alive on right despite a bit of pressure from the Titans. And Yarkor posting up between the towers looking for a purple buff invade. Stu doesn't want to let this one go, but Yark can just keep pulling him out you here. Have to. You have to let it go. Stuart up. Now two levels behind is Stuart in the dual lane as Yarkor will steal away a purple buff. Once left alone, Miff, he's an Ami. It just kept things up over in the dual lane. Yarkor has been ice cold all weekend long. Game one and early goings of game two, no different. I mean, York's the only one that didn't even celebrate after game one. Uh, you, you look at the player cam, it doesn't even seem yep. like it had even hit him yet. So, keeps his cool here, has work to do yet. And the Camelot Kings, so far in game two, doing exactly that. Scaling very good. We talked about Hebo for Paul in the previous match, Captain Twig. I mean, same pick, essentially same build, just about as well so far. Means that he's got a good deal of damage coming his way once he gets a couple more items. Paul, though, not too far behind him. The Book of Thaw starting to stack up, moving in towards that penetration. I think around third items where Tiamat feels confident in her ability to get involved in the team fight, and that's the Tartarus Titans at their best. When they've got Paul at their back, just got to buy a couple more minutes for him. Speaking of itemization, let me tell you something about Tier 2 Hydra Smith. Uh-huh, yeah, go on. Just kidding. Looks like it's about to get upgraded. I don't even have time for the bit. Fully upgraded for Sino, it's a good power spike for him there out of the jungle. Now it's back-to-back -back games, Myth, where the, the Thanatos, specifically in the same area, on the right side of the jungle, has just been run at from the Camelot Kings. Clearly that's disrupted the flow, maybe, of Sino here in the finals. It has. Sino struggling to find the lead. Thanatos a pick that's so good in the early game, but with the Hebo outpacing for now, Sino's gonna have to look elsewhere. The CC, the matchup right now too, I mean, you might just favor Hebo in a 1v1. Wow. We're gonna see him in a 2v2 in mid. Or will we? Said the sleep out of Aurora. Captain Twig, a miraculous game number one on the Hunbats. We're finding plenty of setup. And now the Camelot Kings in They're early on gold fury pull, but it's spotted out by the Tartarus Titans. But th th that's what I'm talking about. When you, when you can't rule out the objectives early in this game, the Kings have shown us all weekend long. They'll sneak it away from you. They'll pull it right in front of you. This time, though, the Titans were close enough by to answer, but if we got two kills and nearly 3,000 gold down already for the Titans. That's a Camelot Kings classic that we got an inch, so it's actually a mile every single time. I guess they just don't understand how our, our measurement system here works over in the US, but. I don't know how to convert it. Yeah, I don't either, so bad joke by me, maybe? Yeah, it's unlucky. Well, what? 1 to 12, 12 to 5,280, something like that. You do the math. Well, we just confirmed that neither of us know what we're talking about. Yeah, you're right. Instead, I doubled down for some reason. This Titans team, though, they are so capable of making plays. We have seen in, in games of past, hell, even yesterday, they go five against the Dragons. But the Gold Fury simply shreds oh, the Kings. We'll get the Gold Fury despite a steal attempt from Aurora. And now the Fright breaks out. Genetics rooted in place. Sino's got damage for him. He's an execute. Three stuns from Stu. Genetics though is healed up. Frenzy used. Sino on the execute. But Yarkor answers back. It's a boulder through. Variety's gone crazy. But Yarkor, he's alive. Knocks him he's down. got autos. Yarkor finishes off Aurora. Double kill for the hunter of the Camelot Kings. The objective already in their pockets. But can SOT Whoa. catch him out? No. no. Got to reset here. Nothing to fight over quite yet. Love that play from the Kings. It's Yarkor who's free casting the entire time. Genetics actually utilizes the wall around Gold Fury to block the epic uppercut. That is ridiculous. Genetics can't play characters with walls. It, it just can't be the case. He, he's so good at controlling the map in situations like that. If Aurora knocks somebody up there, it's a completely different fight. The Tardis Titans were very nearly able to turn it around regardless. It's those small margin plays, the, these magnificent little micro interactions that the Camelot Kings continually find that just keep pushing them up. All right, so no gods with walls for genetics. So what, I guess technically Maui with his ult, right? That's off the table. It's like 20. Ymir's now gone. Yeah, there's like 20 of them. Uh, Yamoja's up there. Oh, that's not good. Looking at Terra. All right, so you're banning three and, and picking a couple if you're the Titans if this game ends up going sideways, but Genetics, what a story he has had this weekend as well. Certainly still a rookie, right? We, we've established that. <laughs> I think that's how it works. Titans, now it's time, though, 
where you can't just let the king slowly run away with this game, but the Pyromancer is going to get yoinked up. Oh, no, it's stolen. Aurora gets it, finally. Some magic for the Titans, and it's needed. It's right on time, and it'll be a tier one tower. Pushed down by Stu on left. That is massive for the Titans. If the Camelot Some Kings life. cleanly grab the Pyro. I mean, it's not looking good, oh, but no. it, it still might not be. Oh no, is that life gonna get snuffed out? A blink away from Sino, so he'll live. Now Sot on the chase, shouldn't be. The Kings will group up his five. And a worthwhile map trade for the Tartarus Titans, Smith. They get Pyromancer shoved down a tier one tower on left. And signs of life from the Titans here in game two. Stu steals away some offerings as well. Keeps that a bit more even. The Tartarus Titans, they've kept their heads above water. And we've started to approach that critical time of the game. Paul has been free farming for so long now that he's starting to stack up the damage. On this back, should have a massive power spike, essentially sitting on an entire item in pocket. This Tiamat, she's joining the fray. Yeah, and you're, you're just waiting on that moment from Paul, right? Over the course of the last couple of weeks, we have talked about so many players and their individual performance history. It was the third pillar of Worlds, by the way, Miff. I don't know if you saw that video. The Playmakers, the MVPs, right? Yeah, 40 times. I helped you write it. You did. You made some very critical changes in that video. Paul is one of them, a Playmaker, an MVP. Has stood up for his team time and time again over the last couple of years. It takes an MVP, a Playmaker, to get to four finals in a row. This Tiamat, one of his story picks, will start spooling up. Might have something to say about these double ADCs. Yeah, the damage output there now, the burn potential on the CC, it synergizes really well with the Kumbakarna, that groggy strike, the second ability from Aurora, just locking them in place, the Mez afterward as well, just allows you to get every single bit of that primordial onslaught, that seven piece combo first ability from Tiamat to find their way home. It's a lot of long range artillery damage, good CC follow up with the Glyph. And then even after that, Tiamat incredibly slippery in the late game. Gets a little bit of defense, went in the quadrupedal stance, has access to two jumps, CC immunity in the kit, the ability to push waves without even being there by spawning up minions. All very, very good. The only weakness is that early game. And well, Paul, he's evaded it. Hasn't had to fight in the early game just yet. Hasn't fallen a single time. And now even has a lead over his direct lane opponent. Unfortunately for the Titans, that's about as good as it gets with Paul leading his lane opponent where SOT is falling behind. So as Aurora, so is Stuart, both of them a couple of levels behind. And Myth, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to avoid the fighting much longer. Yarkor, a great split push. He'll get the tier one tower away from the Titans on the left side of the map. And a Fury about to respawn. A critical decision-making point already approaching for the Titans at the 18 minute mark. Can you afford to give up this Fury? Do you feel like you even have a chance in a fight? And it looks like Titans, they'll send a few over towards left just to maintain presence. Solo laners don't lie. If SOT is here, the Tartarus Titans are willing to defend. The Camelot Kings, though, it's a massive advantage. Have got every bit of the lead, experience and gold over to them. Meaning that the burst potential there, if Varadi finds a pull onto anybody, be it a tank, be it a backliner, preferably a backliner, but doesn't necessarily matter when you've got this much damage output and a double hunter composition, could just shut down the Tartarus Titans immediately. Aurora, in particular, has to play very cautiously. Hasn't exactly gone for the tankiest build. Instead, wants those relics up and wants them up often. Relic dagger in second slot means blink initiation. It'll be there, but can he survive afterward? I'm not so sure. He's only got one relic. Whoa. He's Whoa, only got the blink, this? whereas there's a frenzy and a bracer for the Camelot Kings. Two members of the Kings. They're on the fire giant knows. right now, Mifflin. But again, a sneaky fire giant. It's a pull from the Kings, but wherewithal presence from the rest of the Titans to rotate through. Aurora's used his ult, ton of genetics. Man, this level 10 Kumba myth, it is taking some chunk damage. He's not felt great so far. Shoved back from Variety and out Lord of the Afterlife, out from SOT as well. The question is, is that enough of an advantage for the Kings to now force one of the objectives? I mean, it's a lot. I, I think you immediately move in towards the Fury here. The Camelot Kings, they've taken away the escape tool from SOT, Aurora's initiation. Now it's up to just long-range damage. 
can Paul do enough to get someone into that execute threshold? Does Aurora have something else in the back pocket? Oni Fury melted through. Aurora through the pass and Big Man Tings on the first kill. Titans left backpedaling. And for now, the Fury is reset. There's not much range, though, for the Titans to get back in. The Kings, they go Oni Fury plus one. I wonder, can the Camelot Kings now immediately rotate in towards the Fire Giant? They've got a lot of crit. Take a peek at Yarkor's build. This is one we don't get to see too often. Shadow Steel, Wind Demon. Wind Demon's fallen off a bit. But immediately into the Deathbringer, he is shredding objectives right now. He doesn't even need to worry about the penetration. You've got that for Big Man Tings. That Executioner applies that passive to everybody. Doesn't matter. And have you not built it yourself. The synergy between the two going to rear its head here. Kings, take it slow. The They've let the Tartarus Titans know where they are now. Pyromancer falls. Whoa. What a roar. You've gone in? He's gone in. He's put a couple to sleep. Yarkor takes some poke damage. Sino had an axe for him. Now Paul out of mid now, and Camelot Kings playing this one a bit slower. You're not worried about too much on your side of the map if you're the Titans. You clearly can't let the Kings grab this next Fire Giant, but it is a terribly awkward scenario just through great map play and objective play, and early pressure again from the Kings. It's a 6,000 gold lead at the 20 and a half minute mark. Titans got to reply somewhere, but it's, it's that slowly moving goalpost. You keep moving them further back. I'm going to defend here. No, OK, I'll back up, defend next time. And eventually, you're in your Titan room. Tough decision-making tree for the Titans. First step for the Tartarus Titans, Aurora needs to be level 12. You need that second relic, something you can help out the team with. Because right now, the CC not quite there. He's not tanky enough to stick around in the fight. So maybe a heavenly sprint for his team so they can escape situations or chase out these low HP targets or, or a bracer of radiance, some vision, some power for his squad. At level 11, this Kumakarna just not valuable. Do you send him off to solo a wave? That would just about do it. He's got to be close. Hovering around the fire giant, being forced just by threat of the Camelot Kings, double hunter composition of, hey, well, if they get to the fire and we leave him alone for five, six seconds, it's going to be gone. Aurora is constricted in where he's allowed to rotate. Finally finds a little bit of farm on the right. Well, Mim, you, you mentioned it earlier in this game. Won't get a chance to talk about it now. Sod. Crossed the side by Twig. Last water hands won't connect. It's such a threatening side of the map to get picked on, especially when the Camelot Kings maintain their grouping, and it looks like clearing out some ward coverage. It is such a tense moment here for the Titans. Aurora's already stolen away one objective, but for my money, I can't remember many objective steals so far this weekend, as there's still one in store. Early in the Smite World Championship Grand Finals might need to happen for the Tartarus Titans. Myth, they are not backing away. A slight wave pushing up tier two on left will not pull the Titans back. No, not just yet. I think the only way the Tartarus Titans step up is if they see the Fire Giant actually pulled. Mid tower. Goodness gracious. That's an easy grab. Double Hunters, that's just what they do. Take a peek at Big Man Tings' build as well. Full attack speed stack, already upgrades the starter, finishes up that silver branch. When he pops his second ability, this ROM gets additional attack speed. That's gonna give over even more power, meaning that if Big Man Tings just presses two, goes up into the air, that ultimate, which already does immense damage, will only do more. Man, Sot, he'll pick up Spectral Armor. Won't even be able to complete that tier two item he's got. You think he's feeling a bit threatened by Yark here, Myth, who is almost full build at the 23 minute mark, far and away ahead of his opponents. Sod is down to half. Fire Giant is as well. It's a good wall. Excavate good down, stun. Roar, stunned. They got and him. And it's Kumba simply too far behind. And Yark Horn notches his fourth. SOT too low to stick around. The Camelot Kings moving fast, back up, pull the fire giant, drop down to 50%. Wow, they're the going to get it. Titans. I mean, there's nothing you could do about this one. Man. That's the issue. That's the issue of the roar being as squishy as he is. He can't even check the fire giant. He walks up one step out of line, and the long range CC of the Camelot Kings beat the pull from Variety, the knock up from Twig, the slows, the walls from Genetics, the stuns from Range. Just catch him out and a couple of auto attacks is all it takes to knock them down. Myth, this is an absolute dismantling by the Camelot Kings. The same thing that happened in game one is just getting run back here in the second game. Titans have not been able to answer that early pressure. And now, a fire, you, what was the end of the script in game one? The first fire giant opened up all of the phoenixes. You take one, eventually you go back. Now you're 15,000 gold ahead. You're fighting at the 24 minute mark. 
With 10,000 gold above your opponent, Yarkor's reached full build. Or you will here in just a moment. Level 20 on him. The roar still far behind. Dare I say we're at miracle needed territory again for the Titans in the second game. I mean, there, there still are comeback mechanics. It's the same ones as last time. You're working hard up here, buddy. I appreciate uh, uh, you. Look, the Tartarus Titans can do it. It's, you got to get the defense on a roar. Sino has to make something happen is on it, this Thanatos. Is it Paul right now? Does Stu have enough itemization to, to swing against what the Kings have? Stu has damage, but how Stu applies damage is difficult. You want Ishtar, especially with a build that has Man. crit in it, to be allowed to use that shotgun stance. Because you can't get close to this Camelot Kings entire roster, really. I mean, they're, they are a roaming spike ball. It's like a porcupine on the map. Yep. Because you can't get close, I want to see Stuart get this Odysseus bow, and I want to see him get it as quickly as possible. Maybe even forego upgrading the starter. Switch to that snipe auto, the long-range auto attack from Ishtar. Get some AoE damage out there. Help out Paul a little bit from that range. Then you've got Sino with the execute. If Sino executes anybody and then immediately dies, and he will immediately die, we're fine with that. That is a value trade. You just got to get one. That's the first step for the Tartarus Titans. This has just been unbelievable. I mean, think back to how the Kings have played all weekend long. We were, we were wondering how, how disrespectful maybe was it. We were like, wow, the Ravens kind of gave them a run for their money in the first set, right? Some of those games. They went hard. They went easy. long. Right, they did. And then a 3-0 against the Olympus Bolts. It has been clean from the Camelot Kings after going five in the phase three playoffs, securing themselves first seed. They have not dropped a game yet at Worlds, and I'm not sure they're gonna drop one here in game two. Titans, you're hoping Paul can spool up some of that Worlds Paul. Wow, it's at so the end fast. Of the second game. My goodness, mid lane Phoenix before I even see it. It's gone, the Kings only sent two to mid, and there's just no defense from the Titans. Twig has to reset from his team. Brief opportunity for a five versus four. Tartarus Titans, unfortunately, haven't got the same luxury we do on the cast. They don't have the bird's eye view. Twig already resets. He's on the way in. Variety runs away. And the rest of the Camelot Kings, confident but respectful. That's how the Kings play their game. They realize there's still some opportunities for the Titans. Stewart dashes away here, and he's already used his ultimate. It's just a threat of Variety in the back line. Has forced the ultimate defensively from Stewart. Now your back line, so much more susceptible. Snipes, they oh. are dropping down. Paul pulled pull. back by Variety. He's gone. And Variety solos Paul execute. on the main stage, but there's an execute from Sino. A frenzy sends it right back. Camelot Kings have dropped the Phoenix, and they're looking for the game. Four versus three. The Camelot Kings, again, respectful. Not moving in just yet. There still is one tower standing, giving over additional defense, but all they need is that minion wave to push forward. Captain Twig has so much damage, a little bit of CC, anybody on the Titan's dead. You've got double ADC and you've got confidence. That's all the Kings have needed. That's all they'll need in game number two in the Smite World Championship Grand Finals to your Camelot Kings. You gotta knock these guys off balance. You asked me if I was a coach, what's the advice? The Tartarus Titans gotta change something. They have to shift up their pace. They need to fight on the Camelot Kings terms because if it's gonna come down to neutral farm in the early, if you're just saying, let's wait for Paul. Once Paul's in the late game, we'll be fine. The Camelot Kings are the best team in the world at just farming up and they will punish you every step of the way. You cannot play their pace. You have to drag them into yours. This is unbelievable. I said dismantling during that cast and I stand by it. I agree. Game one and game two, the Kings simply running down the Titans, and they're so great at farming in the mid game, but they've also been great at finding first blood, finding early kills, getting Twig off to good starts in these games as well. I think there's a lot for the Titans to address in, in picks and pans for game three, Myth. Mentality's got to be one game at a time. We've seen crazy things happen in Smite World Championship Grand Finals. Titans, they've got a lot to adjust, but there's still magic. There's something to be said with this Titan squad. We'll find out what happens with them in game three. But first, it's Hindu Man with an announcement. Ha hello? Hello, Kiyomi. Don't leave. Don't leave. If you're leaving the room, I advise you not to right now. Real quick, we did a bit of something special because, you know, it's season 10. Who's coming to the after party after this? All right, all right, it's not for you guys. Who wants to come to the after party after this? 
I can't take you all, but if you look under your seat right now, you may find a ticket from you and a plus one to the after party. Check under your seat. If you find a ticket, come to the front and meet Bart, who's waiting to get you registered for the after party. There is 10 tickets in the crowd. Please be careful. Don't hurt each other. We'll see you at the after party. For now, we'll be back after the break with game three.
Well, welcome back, everyone, to the analyst desk here at SWC for season nine. A lot of work, preparation, all of that going into this event and, of course, into this year. I have to extend a huge thanks to Prime Gaming for being the title sponsor throughout the year here in season nine. Of course, for those of you in the video, those of you at home, uh, you can go ahead and claim your free skins that will rep your favorite SBL team, whether it's the Kings, the Bolts, anyone that's been eliminated, or anyone that's up on that stage, including the Titans. You can claim now. Either scan the QR code, go to gaming.amazon.com slash smite, uh, and you can go ahead and secure those. Of course, you also get so many other goodies. Uh, you can just click on the crown in the top left. If you happen to have not used it, there's also a sub button. You get a free Twitch sub every month, uh, and that's down on the bottom right. I meant top right as well when I said that earlier. So you can click on those, either get your rewards uh, or help support uh, Smite Game and the esports that we have going on. Of course, if you want to support us in other ways, you can show us how you are watching at home or in venue. Hashtag worlds with fans. Something that we are just incredibly, incredibly happy to have fans in the venue. And getting to do this in front of a live audience, it feels amazing. Uh, hell, the last time I got to do it, I was working on Paladin. So it's been a long time. <laughs> since we got to hang out with the crowd the way that we are right now. And of course, seeing all the people who are watching, even those who are in venue, and, and I appreciate the change, fellas. <laughs> I didn't even realize. From Jade to Kings. <laughs> what I a quick it, swap to him. I think it said Twig. Was there a W there? Uh, you know what? If we can hear him, they'll tell us. I'm not and, sure. Yeah, well, maybe we can just see him. They're over there. Yeah. I know they're going to be making noise. They've been pumping it up. The right. chance. Oh, yeah. They're there. <laughs> Not even there. They're right behind us. They're walking around. <laughs> uh, of course, those guys providing a lot of energy. Uh, oh. Necessary. Actually, you know, right now, the Titans, uh, Titans fans, you need to make some noise for them. They need that energy more than ever. They're down 0-2. And of course, they need your help cheering for them in game, cheering for them right now throughout all of it, just making sure uh, that they have some energy because otherwise you end up uh, looking at some other, well, hopefully not, knock on wood. Maybe I can cast or curse it to, to, to not a 3-0. I don't know. Either yeah, way. You could try. Uh, we've only had two so far in history, one of them though last year. Uh, the Titans on the receiving end of that one. Don't want to see that. First blood though, this game again brought to you by the Million Pugs. You can go to millionpugs.com to find out more about them. And of course, uh, their Scotty Pug mascot, Million Pugs, rewards you in Smite loot when you make purchases online, not just that. Uh, it's for all of your favorite games. And so you can sign up now for free at millionpugs.com. Start earning pugs, uh, their point system, to earn, to spend on favorite gems, or even Husky Handler Scotty. And of course, they have uh, tie-in with a lot of brands out there, so it's going to, to pay off for you. Thanks to Million Pugs for sponsoring the First Blood replay, and thanks to everybody on the desk with me for sticking around. And Trelly? Yep. Game two for the Titans. We were wondering about adjustments, and uh, it, it just goes a little awry. No, we throw that out the window. So here's what I've learned. Okay. Uh, in the first game of the quarterfinals, or yep. I guess in the fourth game of the quarterfinals, Carter's Titans, uh, I counted them out. I said, nope, they're not going to win. They won. Semi-finals, same thing. I said, no, surely not, the Tartarus Titans. I have learned not to count them out, and as far as I'm concerned, this is exactly where they want to be. Until the Titan somehow drops in, in game three or four or five, uh, I'm not counting them out just yet. They have the potential for that comeback. They always have. Paul's World's runs have always been this kind of comeback underdog story. Yeah. So I'm thinking either A, they got them right where they want them, or B, they've just been, uh, they've been powering up to a massive play here. Hurry, you're a reasonable person. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about game number two. Trelly uh, seems to be convinced that the Titans are not down and out. And admittedly, I agree. They're not out until it's over. Right. But Hurry, how are you feeling after game number two? What kind of things need to change? Yeah, I'll echo the sentiment that I think a lot of people are feeling right now in that it's grim right now for the Titans. It looks like the pacing is just not favoring them at all. It kind of yeah. is hard for them to get their foot in the door at any point in these games right now. I, I think they're capable. I think that's reasonable to say. But in the form that we're seeing the Kings, the form we're seeing the Titans, it is very, once again, grim for the Titans right now. I think they just need to seriously just keep digging and hope they find 
you know, that magic, maybe that magic pick that works for them to yeah. kind of just get them in the groove. We know they're capable of it. Oh, yeah. We've seen them come from back from worse in the regular season and things like that. I know these guys. I know they're working hard through it. I know they have more ideas that they haven't even shown at all yet at this tournament. So I'm excited to see what that will exactly be. And I hope that we get some more games. Yeah, I think the worry here for the, the Titans, though, is that the Kings... They didn't play anything that they played last game. The only repeated pick was the Rama, which changed roles. They've switched everything up. You've tried to counter their game one draft. They've gone to a completely different one in game two, and they're playing completely new picks. I don't think we've seen Izanami or Hercules from this team, possibly yeah. even all season. It just seems like there's so much depth in these Kings drafts. Yeah, the Hercules coming out. Uh, you get eight assists there on Twig. Again, another dying game from teams and hardcore to the point where they... Might be able to do something rare if they go undying in a set, oh my let alone in a finals. Wow. Uh, it would be absolutely insane to see. But we've got a long path to get there. Uh, and so we can move beyond game number two to start looking at what is on the horizon. Cresting, whether it's a sun going up or down, we don't know just yet. Is it the sunset or the sunrise for the Titans? Uh, and Shelly, that is, is where the mind has to shift now. What do you want to see from them? What kind of changes? Not just, hey, they're, they're not out. Where do they start applying some of that pressure? How do they push back? Yeah, and first and foremost, uh, I want to say that the Kings have been playing phenomenally. I don't think that that can be understated. Yeah. They are not And they're going to keep playing phenomenally, Correct. It seems. They are not making many mistakes. So, Tarius Titans are going to have to bring it to the Kings. They can't just sit back and say, hey, we'll play our our breakneck brand of smite where, mm -hmm. you know, Sino's going to get some clutch executes, we're going to find some early aggression, and then just, you know, carry that forward. It's not going to work. The Camelot Kings have shown that they can play many different brands of smite to such a high level. So I'm thinking, uh, first of, maybe big man Tings and Yarkor, they need to die. Step one, <laughs> get a kill onto these carries because executing the tanks, you know, finding some kills on these tank, your targets all well and good. But these damage dealers, yeah. they've been going unchecked. Well, I've got good news for everyone out there. If you're rooting for the Kings or you want to see a comeback, it has to start in picks and bans for game number three. And this is where the momentum can potentially shift because not only are the Titans on a different side this time around, but like you said, Paul back against the wall, of course, during a world level tournament. It's a dangerous territory to be. He doesn't like being cornered. And we'll bite back. They're going to have to see some shifts. The Kings, meanwhile, are keeping things the same. Amaterasu, Kabraken banned out the other side. And hurry, maybe the adjustments you had wanted to see going from one to two now happening and two to three. And instead of the Kern, we get Rom off the board. We get the Ymir off the board, adjusting to specifically the King's taste. Yeah, I think the Rama has been uh, a worry in a lot of these fights for the Titans. That all just coming up from up top and just adding some additional da damage has really been problematic. I think it's correct for the Titans to swap sides with both yeah. first picks not working. I think it's correct to let something else through that they think could be a problem, see if they can deal with that a bit better. Yeah. Maui has been very good for genetics so far. I think the Titans are willing to take that risk at this point in the set after falling down two games to see if they can be the ones who can finally deal with genetics on this Maui. I think it's possible. This also gives them the Hebo, which I don't know if it was the biggest problem last game, but Hebo yeah. always kind of acts as insurance for the game. If you get ahead with the Hebo on your team, it's very hard to lose. He just kind of packs a big punch in the back line that you always have to worry about. So I think it's fine to take that away. And I think the Ishtar is always an okay pick to take in your top three for your Hunter. Especially considering one of the things the casters were talking about in that last game that, that they really got in depth on was the ranged CC that came into the, the equation. And Hebo, long range knockup. Ishtar, technically long range stun, right? Good damage that can come out of that. Titans may be able to clap back. But Hazer, the Kings are keeping a little bit of that rolling. The ult, the hook, a lot from Maui still keeps them able to engage from far away. Yeah, absolutely. It seems to be sort of a facet of their play. They want to make playing the game scary for frontliners. If you have range CC, we saw it for the Kumba yeah. in that last game. You can't walk up. You try and walk up, you get terror walled in, you get stunned out, you get knocked up, you get hurt too, you get pushed back <laughs> in. It's incredible the CC teams chains these pro teams can put together. Yeah. Titans might be looking for some of the same. Maybe they can try and punish out this Maui get him into your back line and get their damage onto the Maui, preventing him from being the one engaging. 
The jousting is back in Yeah, I think this is really wow. interesting. Oh, the boy. Kings are taking a bit more time here in their top three. I think they were very used to getting one of these two hunters that was banned away by the Titans in their top three previous to this game. And so now they've kind of had to think a little bit harder about what they're Ooh. willing to take in the top three. <laughs> Vulcan, I'm definitely happy to see if I'm a Kings fan. Lancelot, I'm never sad to see. But it's usually been a hunter in this slot. So we'll have to see how that affects the rest of the draft as we see it. What do you think, Trelly? I just haven't seen an answer to the Maui into blank combo for the Camelot Kings. The Lancelot has been there. The Vulcan has been there. And now they get both? It seems to me the Titans had to know the Maui was coming, right? They, maybe they thought, hey, they're going to prioritize that Hippo a bit more. The Kings say no. If you have seen Genetics play this pick throughout the entirety of this tournament, you will know why he had a, he had a look on his face. The second he saw the bands, Genetics made a face that was like, wait, what's good? You're giving me Maui? And I tend to echo that. This top three is insane. However, we get to see that Sylvanas Ishtar combo that is going to bring good clear. And take a look at that ban. Iza is gone. There is no doubt now. The Titans should have incredible pressure in that dual lane, bar none. No matter what ADC comes through, as long as that Iza is gone, Ishtar and Sylvanas should be getting pressure in the early. I, I mean, talk about just lane clear. Yep. <laughs> lobs on lobs on lobs. Uh, they're going to have that Izanami you had mentioned as a ban. Danza Burrow as well taken away by the Titans. Trying to control, maybe damage control at this point, especially considering the top three, but at least control the Kings and the duo lane, and specifically last year's world's MVP Ooh. solo turned carry. They lock in the Pele as well for the jungle with the Sylvanas. They're changing it up. They're looking to play their game here for the Titans. Guan Yu Nemesis banned out by the Kings. Hazer, how are you feeling about the Pele? I think Pele is a good pick. I think Sino has stepped away from the Thana. He tried it twice, didn't even end up getting banned away from him. They opt to get rid of the Nam instead. The Kings show that they're not scared of this Thana, that they're not threatened by it. I like the switch up though. Pele, this comp for the Titans could snowball. I mean, you look at it, you don't want to be playing against the Pele, a Sylvanas, and Ishtar, and a Hebo from behind. They can dominate if they get ahead early. And now the Titans need to push in the early game. With this comp, they cannot be taking it late, hurry. I think that's a good call out, and I think they have the perfect comp to do that now. They guaranteed have duo pressure this game. Odin, picked by the Kings, notably. This has been hovered and banned away many times, played by Haddix earlier in the tournament as well. With no success. And the Chernabog. Now, a lot of the Hunters were gone, so he didn't have a lot of options here when it comes to his final Hunter selection. I do know that Hardcore likes this Chernabog pick. I'm not sure if it's exactly what they're looking for. They will have to take a bit of a backseat in this lane compared to the previous games, which I think could cause a little bit of stress oh on the King. I want to see the side me. lanes step up here for the Titans. And I think this aggressive dual lane yeah. combo of the Ishtar and Sylvanas and now the Ravana for the SOT could be exactly what they're looking for in this game three. I see a situation here where I think just Pele has a great matchup into Vulcan. We know that Paul has played Pele mid in the past. He already has lost once on the Hebo where he wasn't able to get that much off. I could see a world where they switch it up. Put Paul on the Pele, say, hey, you need to dumpster BMT. You need to try and first blood him early. Maybe it's too risky on the world stage when everything's on the line, but if you're trying to get this Vulcan off to a terrible start, throwing a Pele right next to him at level two could be a great way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Pele just going to be able to pressure out that Vulcan, run him down. It just depends if they've practiced this, yeah. right? You're not gonna, you're not just going to throw this one out of nowhere. If Sino's been playing the Hebo in scrims, then I would love to see this switch up. I think it's a great call out. The Raven to close things out. You know, trying to answer in terms of pressure. Uh, one of the few, maybe only, on the side of the Titans that can escape an Odin cage. Hurry. It feels like if Odin gets off to a good start, if he starts to run the show, he can continue that over and over. I, I will <laughs> I go back to a couple days ago. We did see a comp that had like a Ymir, an Odin on it, and there was no Phantom Shell picked up. I have to imagine that's maybe not immediately. It doesn't have to be your first relic because he's off in solo lane, but it has to be on the minds, right? It has to be on your mind, and I think if I'm Aurora in this game, I'm definitely getting a Phantom Shell. There's a lot of scary things for him on the other team whether you're getting Maui pulled in, caught up in the Lancelot engage, Vulcan alts, Odin cage, uh, terminally slowed by Chernabog. I think you've got a lot of things to worry about. So he probably wants more relics than he can actually buy this game to keep himself safe, <laughs> which is kind of always a concern when you're playing a character like Sylvanas. Yeah. But when this character succeeds is when he is ahead and when he's the one running the show. So I would expect his relics to reflect that, and I would expect the game plan of the Titans to reflect that too. I think we'll see a drastically different pace of this game 
especially if the Titans are making the adjustments they need to make in order to stay competitive in this set. Well, I am admittedly curious. It's, it's going to be an audible, but a fan vote on who they think is going to do well. For those who see this draft and think it's going to go to be the Kings, I want to hear it. Okay, not bad. Not, not, bad, not bad at all. And they're going. Now, how about those who think it's going to be the Titans? and push us at least to game four. Not Relatively bad. even, but I think a little bit more. Now how about the people who just want a game four in general, just want this set to keep going? That's me. <laughs> I don't want to cheer. I think you're going to come through. It's me. Yeah, out. people. I'm people. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm cheering people. for that one. <laughs> uh, trying to go for the prolong. I know we've talked a lot about at least the bottom two and maybe a little on the Robin. I want to rewind a little bit for the Kings. Hazer. Uh, you know, yeah, we, we've seen the Vulcan, the Lancelot, though, prior to that. That has been a huge pick for Twig, and when it's not up there, you know, yes, he's gone for the Hunbats, he's gone for other iconic picks, but I feel like this one is starting to rival them, at least in terms of performance. Yeah, I think it's been his best character this year. I think Twig had a little bit of an off year throughout the season, honestly. Regular season, he was struggling when this team opted to make the roster change. Talked about it himself, having a rough time. But when he got on this Lancelot, that is when he performed, and in this tournament, not the strongest pick through the early mid game, but late game. That ult providing so much space control and trapping people in as we see Stu on the cams and the crowd going wild again. Look, if there's one thing he's got, it's fans out there, right? <laughs> and look, regardless of how this set goes, I think, uh, I think Stu's made a fan of me as well. I, I've been talking about him a lot this year. I mean, even memed to the point where he would have rolled back to mid season eight. Uh, is he a hindrance or an asset? He's been an asset all year long. Uh, and Stewart putting on a lot, especially now on the line, going back to the Ishtar hurry. Uh, Titans as a whole, though. Sylvanas brings a different level of engage. We had talked about it in the bands. Now, how do you feel about it as the pick? Healing, CDR that's going to be later on, polls, CC. It feels like it should be there. Yeah, you should expect Aurora to be playing up and baiting himself a lot in these team fights. I would also expect him to go towards this Cronus pendant later in the game. The reason he does this in the later slots if we get there is because he's just about protection capped with that Sylvanas yeah. heal and the other protection items with the starter protections and everything adding up at that point that there's no point in buying another defensive item. So a lot of times he'll go that Cronus pendant combined with Sylvanas passive. It yeah. just lets you just kind of hyper heal up your team. You kind of have a Sylvanas heal every one or two seconds. So if you see him do that, that's why. The Titans are a very disciplined team when it comes yep. to playing with healers. And so I'm super happy to see the hen go to that ultimately. I'm excited to see what they have to offer. I want to hear it in the crowd. Give it up for game number three as we jump up to the casters for what could be the last time today. Miff, I'm, I'm, I'm fingers crossed. It's not. I think the arena, the fans, we're all hoping for at least a game four. We love another game five. But Miff, maybe for the last time this year, where does the journey of a thousand steps start? With the first step. And the first step for the Tartarus Titans is, is game number three here, and it's got to be a total overhaul of what we've seen from games one and, and game two. Early first blood, early jungle fight. Sinos changed up his pick here, Myth. It's going to be a Pele, we assume. Yes, it'll be Pele. I just had to double check. You, you thought Spoilers. it might be. A, sorry, spoiled it. We're going to find out in a second anyway. Uh, but Sino on this Pele here, Myth. Hopefully a little jolt of early action for this Titans team. Yeah, we've seen Sino on this pick a few times in the past, and it's worked out very well for him. High mobility, high single target damage, good AoE once you get access to that volcanic lightning. But maybe the primary thing is, has the ability without ultimate to initiate the fight on his own. The, the knockup, so strong. Well, Smite fans, in to game three we go. Camelot Kings and Titans, maybe one more. But Titans fans begging. For a game four, a game five, it's going to have to go all five if the Titans are going to turn this around and win themselves a Smite World Championship. But Miff, this Kings team has been clean, undefeated all weekend long. And you know, I admire the creativity. We talked in game one about how not only in shot calling, but in picks and bans, the Titans have been theory crafters so far here in season nine. Aurora changes it up yet again here. Kumba Karna in game two, onto the Sylvanas in the third game of the set. I am worried for this Sylvanas, though. It, oh, it, it's no. a pick that, that struggles against walls. It's a pick that struggles against early aggression. Largely immobile. Pulls from genetics could be really difficult to deal with. Does have those AoE cleave auto attacks. Does have a highly aggressive lane uh, partner here with Ishtar from Stu. So 
maybe initiation, the pull from range, the root immediately afterward, undiarable CC, thanks to that knockup. Lots of knockups here for the Tartarus Titans. Could all slowly start to add up. But if we see Variety rotate out early and cage a roar, all of a sudden that healing isn't there. You got no way to deal with it either. This would be a nice early start if a roar can take it away. Yark is so smart. I know, Yark is. It'll be purple buff for Yarkor. Oh, Genetics tough. takes away the purple from Stewart. And it's the opposite of what I had talked about. The Camelot Kings will get both of the purple buffs on the left side. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difference of jungle pathing. It looks like Stu starts at green, actually picks it up for himself. Whereas on the other side, I believe Yarkor just does red buff w w with his mid laner yep, and then immediately rotates over towards that purple. Has access to the hog. We saw Roar hold off on the auto attack. It's about 70 HP left. So it would have taken one auto attack from each to secure it. Whoever goes first just loses out. Unless you have an item that you can purchase just straight up does 200 damage. And Yarkor planned perfectly around it. Man, what a world where genetics with a world championship ending game will get this Maui. It has destroyed opponents all weekend long. It's been banned out since then. And now he'll get a look at it in what could be the final game of the Season 9 Smite World Championships. And you think he's feeling himself a bit? Have you seen him after these games up on stage? He was confused. He was wondering where the Titans were after the end of that second game. Yark's still ice cold, as we've expected. This is a team that's playing with some confidence. And Maui, a god that feels great when you're playing it with a little extra confidence. Yeah, I mean, Maui is just a pick that if you can find those leaps consistently, get that stun rolling, the additional movement speed, essentially a heavenly sprint built into the kit with that second ability, the pulls, the high CC. I mean, it's just aggression top to bottom. Man, a roar. We get jumped on here. A battle of the pulls between the supports. Now he's got more. Does have more. Like four or five even. Tell me I'm wrong though. No, they both have pulls. That's right, they both have pulls and that's that's the only category we're looking for here in game three. Aurora's been hit by too many, though. Yark dashes forward at level three in a backflip oh, Stu? from Stewart. Wrong as way, he's gone on the wrong side of this fight. This time he'll back away. No Izanami this time. And nearly a first blood for the Tartarus Titans. Variety and Twig line up around the blue buff. It's Variety dropped low, but Sido might be oh, the one no. in danger. Oh no, it's a 2v2 over in Solo. Solo or Troll has been quiet this set so hold far. On, hold on, hold on. But he wants to make it noisy. And it's first blood for the first time over to the Titans on right. And Variety will leap away from danger. That is exactly what you need to see if you're a Tartarus Titans fan. Sino, quiet performance so far here in the oh, finals. No. Aurora used a hog. He used it away oh, from the purple tough. buff. He dropped it on accident. But still, it's not able to get secured. Hold oh no, on. he's going to get chased down. He has he's no okay, more mana. Okay. And he'll live. A slight blunder there from Aurora is given the Titans purple buff over to the Kings. That's just a small win here for the Camelot Kings. Overall, though, doesn't cancel out what the Tartarus Titans accomplished That's right, on the other it's first side. blood. Haven't first seen blood. it yet. Massive. Oh, no, but Sino. He's okay, he's okay. He's okay? He's okay. <laughs> he was held up there for a second. Blue buff dropped for SOT. Pele Myth carried a lot of weight coming into this game. And you, you told me off cast during picks and bans on the other side of the jungle, you maybe expected Captain Twig to go to something a bit more comfortable. That might be the Lancelot SOT though. So level five, he's gonna have to fight against the Lancelot at the 2v1 over in the solo lane and Sot has not backed down. No, well, might need to though. Captain Twig left running. And my goodness, this Robin in the early goings starting to feel it for SOT. Damage mitigation and healing for this Robin. So difficult to deal with those auto attacks, giving the HP shield SOT survives this small encounter. I thought Twig would go back towards this Lancelot. It's a high stakes situation. He's been chasing the hammer for so long. Wants to be comfortable here in such a good spot as well. I mean, top to bottom, the Camelot Kings have got themselves a comfortable composition. The only departure from the norm is Variety on this Odin. Haven't seen a whole lot of that from him, but have seen a good deal of Odin so far this event has a great matchup against individual members of the Titans. Sino, he's gone mid, big man Tings. No ult has used the beat. Is the damage there? Yes, okay. it is. Paul has arrived out of the mid lane as well. And for the first time in three games, Titans with the early kills. It's Sino, the difference maker this time. It's just getting active on the map. That Thanatos was a bit slow, but Pele, he seems comfortable running it down everywhere. And now oh, it's man. SOT, he's playing with confidence SOT too. SOT, he's gonna get his ultimate back here shortly. Twig's got his. 
and Sot, a player that when, when he starts to feel himself a bit, these are the types of plays he looks to make. Continue to run down your opponents, give up nothing for free. Remember the Robin back during, what was it, di full damage mitigation? Oh, that was an awful That was time. Sot. Sot started a lot of that off. And now he'll go back to it in a must win game three. And so a stronghold on the map, though not an experience lead, but a confidence lead potentially for Solo or Troll on the right. Sino will go back to base with a kill and an assist in the back pocket and a one level lead over Twig. Yeah, giving a kill to Paul. That knockout oh, no. lead, oh, Tiggs! No. Oh no, it's Tiggs with no beads! And it's Paul and a roar with another out of mid! Knock up into pool combo looks true for the Tartarus Titans. That is not easy to execute on. Big Mad Tings, no mobility on this Vulcan. Backfire takes you about a half foot. Not enough to escape the clutches of the Tartarus Titans who are striking early. A similar pace to game one, but inverse. And now it's the Titans with all the momentum. Can you hear it, Miff? It's hope from the Tartarus Titans fans. They're thinking this game three, at least at the onset, is a fantastic start. Now, I don't want to dampen that flame, but let's talk about the Kings and some of the turnarounds they've had this weekend. They've gone three, 4,000 gold down at times, twice, in fact, so far in, uh, in the semifinals when we saw them play. It's about punishing overextensions. That's what the Tartarus Titans need to win, I think. Well, we'll see. Could no be beads. an opportunity here. Sino considering a reinitiation, oh. but it's genetics in first. Tings still does not have beads, but he's got Sino on him. Earthshaker doesn't do enough. Sino does, but it's flipped by Yarkor. And so the Camelot Kings able to trade out one for one. Yarkor, not liking the pace of this game, decides to take things into his own hands. That global presence, massive for him. Able to get involved towards the center of the map. And now potentially a bit more. Stu, you're real far up. Oh, he'll dash away. Genetics was close. It was a landfall used by Thinking Genetics in mid. Okay. So counter initiation. Yeah, right there. You were, no, I thought he was going for you, the pull. You thought Genetics was going to maybe step a bit further forward there. So we'll wait, you know, we'll wait with, with bated breath here for what the mid game of game three holds. But if we go back to our, our checkbox here, Miff, not allowing the Kings to run you over in the early game, that was on top of the list. Titans have done fantastically in that department so far. They have, and rule number two, or step two rather, is Check facilitate box number two. Paul. Yep. Make sure he's on a, off to a great start, and so far, exactly that. 1-0-1, one, oh, one. Book of Thoth already starting to stack up as and, well. And 2-B, two 2-B, two limit big man tings. Do, do, not, do not let the opposing mid laner get off to a good start, and this Vulcan's off to an 0-3 beginning of the third game. But even then, it's only about a half level for Paul. Maybe the kill allocation not perfect for the Tartarus Titans. You'd love a couple to find their way to him. Instead, it's a roar, credit for one, two, over to Sino on the other side. I think Sino also a major key here. Just a, a much different performance. It, it is like he flipped a switch. It is day and night to games one and two. Sino active on the map, leading Twig around by the nose. We haven't seen Twig actually choose a battle just yet, has just been following Sino and trying to make sure this Pele isn't doing literally whatever she wants, and so far that's exactly what Sino has done. So far it's looked great for the Titans, though Miff, you talked about it early, gotta feel like this game reaches a massive shift come team fight time. I mean, Agreed. an Earthshaker from Tings who, don't by, miss. by your own uh, admission there, doesn't miss very often. Let's see if Sot and Sino maybe have something for variety here. Now the Odin will be okay. But you've got plenty of grouping opportunities for, uh, for the Camelot Kings. So you've got an Odin Cage, a Grand Joust, Genetics, of course, with Landfall. Opportunities abound, and a lot of eggs in the big man Ting's basket. Yeah, I think so. Varadi, great facilitator. You've got the walls from him, that Odin Cage. We'd seen the Tartar Titans earlier on this weekend. Essentially, just ignore the Odin Cage. No Phantom Shell pickup. I doubt that's the case this time around. Aurora's already got Shell. He's already got Shell. <laughs> Just got to get the right upgrade path, and I think he will. Otherwise, though, it's not just Whoa. the Odin cage. Good ultimate from Paul yep. to avoid the pullback from Genetics. It's also the wall from Genetics. That landfall spawns up some structures. Could make it difficult to maneuver some of the more narrow paths in the jungle. Otherwise, you've got great slow presence. Your core with the Living Nightmare, Twig, Massive Whoa. Cripple. 1v1 opportunity. Stu should be OK. And yeah, we wondered if we would see Yark and Stu battle it out a bit. Goodness, Stu lost half of his health on the back side of that trade. Devour's gauntlet there, so he'll be okay. Maintaining up some of that HP. Genetics will pull away. 
his AD carry. Now, something we haven't talked much about yet, Nif, the rotation potential of this Chernabog. I didn't expect to see it this weekend, but a team that loves to group and run down objectives and, and has been running down fights, you got a fantastic piece of utility out of your AD carry. You do, and it's a little bit awkward because the answer generally is the global presence. If it's an Athena in the solo or a Chernabog in, in the duo, it's bring the fight to them if you don't want to deal with it. But your strongest component right now is SOT on this Robin. He's dealing a lot of damage, seems to be incredibly survivable as well. If you want to fight around the solo, if you're the Tartar Titans, want to play with solo or troll, it's pretty likely that Yarkor can get over to that side of the map and Stu can only watch on. Well, Camelot Kings down a bit in gold, but ever objective-minded, put a little bit of pressure towards that Pyromancer. Man, so it's a great start for the Titans, Myth, but You'd figure it'd be a bit more. It was over a thousand gold. It's now been halved as the farming has caught up for the Camelot Kings. You need to get back to more of this. If you're the Titans, you need to get back to fighting. But the cage is great from Variety, and the Odin leaps away. A simple escape there. I wonder. SOT had the opportunity to go for the ultimate, yep. perhaps just waiting for Variety to use that leap, but gets a bit too far. Maybe a bit of a chase down potential, but let go instead. Variety doesn't have TP. Yeah, they want eyes on the objective. Pyromancer, it's leashed by the Tartarus Titans. Variety's gonna have to walk all the way back to lane. Use teleport just a moment ago. This is slow burning from the Titans. Remember, you've got execute potential with Paul, but it's there for Big Man Tings as well. A double landfall from Got Genetics, three. but it's answered by a roar. Earthshaker, Sino's Sino on the back, who will dash away. And now a roar left alone in the fight, Sot. He helped Paul get Captain Twig, and all five Titans remain alive. Held on to that ultimate for a good reason. SOT turns things around. Captain Twig in no man's land, and it's a Titan surging forward. Well, somehow Variety gets up and over, and it's a clean pick for the Titans, and back to the Pyro. And the Kings have given up chase. But Myth, they're sending themselves over towards left. This would be an aggressive call as Sino's leaving base. They've got a lot of burn potential here, but Sino is going to show Paul some base. Ult. No ultimate from Sino. How's he going to get in? Paul has ult, but he's Just far goes. away. Sino's found the back line, but Yark has gone onto the wall. Kings, they'll grab the Gold Fury, and it looks like they'll get out OK. So Titans get a kill and Pyro, but the Kings trade back for the Fury. I can't believe Yark made it out. We'll see if Variety can if we can turn it around. Paul's got ult. Paul's got ult. Paul's got Variety as well. And an important trade back from the Titans as this Hebo continues to roll. But Twig, he's back from base. He does not have Grand Joust. He's got damage it. for Paul. He's got damage, but so does Sino. We've gone one for one yet again. A back and forth battle. And as the death dust settles, it's a dead even game. Unless Genetics can do oh a bit more. Sharkor in. Oh my God, we're still going, Sino. Oh my goodness, scurries away. But what's Sot doing here? He's alone with three. I need a breather. It's the Titans. We'll send SOT back to mid. You can say whatever you want, but the Titans, they brought it here in our third game. No matter what, the Titans have shown up. But Myth, the Kings ever clean, have fought back in. And, and it's ridiculous. Look at the top of your screen, two to seven. What does that tell you? I would say the Tartarus Titans are dominating. That is a dominant kill lead. Not but 83 they, gold. Yeah, not 83 gold, not 667 experience. What? The, what? How much? Six, six, seven. Yeah, okay. All right, anyway, Tartarus Titans, Myth. What's the assessment? Keep it up. Keep getting active. Don't slow down. Have Sino play as aggressively as he has been. Maybe even Whoa. a greater Scorpion invade. It's four versus three, best case. No way Big Man takes a close gap here. Camelot King's just got to no, let this one get go. Scorpion. They'll get Scorpion. Small objectives build up. They make a difference. We approach the mid-game point, though, Myth. Paul has is, is arrived. You haven't needed to wait for this Hebo to fully farm up. Well underway in his build, but so is Big Man Tings. How does the mid-game change the dynamic between these two compositions? We're finally going to start seeing some full five-on-five five engagements. I think the Tartarus Titans' entire goal should be separate the fight. Make sure the Camelot Kings aren't grouped up as five. Manufacture 2v2s and 3v3s in the jungle. Because when you look at the true five-on-five five of the Camelot Kings, it's scary. You got two massive circular ultimates that synergize incredibly well, Variety and Big Man Tings, when they're playing together. It's not as if Big Man Tings needs the help, but I uh, could use it regardless. Might as well simplify it. Put the circle in the circle and you will evaporate 
your enemies. Otherwise, Genetics, he's been on point with these landfalls so far. Captain Twig, haven't seen the Grand Joust used as a legitimate cripple field just yet. Haven't seen it used to really split up the Titans. Be a little bit easier with the rest of his homies around him. I want to see the Titans really rally around their leads. And right now, there's a three and ones, both Sino and Paul, in a very good position. Burst potential certainly there. It's a pick composition for the Tartarus Titans. Just whether or not the Camelot Kings can find an opportunity to group up his five. So our troll, he arrived early in game three. Three assists out of seven. Twig over on right. Tier one tower low on the Titan solo lane side of the map. Could be a target eventually for this Camelot Kings team. All right, he will leap under the tower, take a little bit of damage, but without Sino immediately there, Variety should be able to scurry away okay. Seems like the type of game if we're, we're now both teams, really the Camelot Kings, you know, they've got a couple games to play with here, even if you drop game three. You know, you're, you're balanced right there. You're, you're, if you're the Titans, you want to keep going, but there's no objectives to fight over on the map. You're realizing the Kings, they're going to fight you in a minute and 15 seconds, as they always do, right when the Pyro, right when those Furies respawn. Yeah, I think Pyro, probably the first one grouped. Could be that it's just a split objective situation. A roar, though. There's your objective. He'll, he'll create opportunities when there are none. Whoa. Able to take a few away, but Yarkor, can he punish? Yarkor roots a roar in place. Who will get a double knockup? Oh, Earthshaker. Good Aegis. It's bound to who's Aegis it perfectly. And a phantom shell needed to keep the AD carry alive. But the Camelot Kings, they've trapped Whoa. the Tyrus Titans. He's low. They've trapped Paul, who a crushing wave away. And Variety's having none of it. Sino standing, but Whoa. barely. How did he get out? Walks himself out. Paul post-mortem with the water carpet. Keeps his jungler alive. But look at the timers. 25 seconds left on this Gold Fury respawn. The Camelot Kings still healthy oh. and nearby. Ooh. Could look for it. Genetics, he's paying the favor forward. Two for one for the Camelot Kings. Hardly devastating for the Titans, but does shift momentum ever so slightly back to the Kings, who are up 2-0 here in the grand finals. It'll be a pri uh, Primal Fury in about five seconds. Tartarus Titans can split out with that Pyromancer. Should that, should that be where their eyes go? Variety about to get his ultimate back. Is Sino feeling aggressive in mid? No, he's not. And no immediate grouping around either of the objectives for either team. Yeah, at, at this point, Odin is not worried about a Pele. The HP shield, the physical defense stack, not threatening on its own. It's a Primal Fury pull okay. from the Tartarus Titans. Nobody's here. This, is, this is it. They're just going to trade. It, it's got to be the Pyromancer, but Aurora's already set up to defend. It's, it's a slightly slow pull, though, around the Pyromancer. Titans are not immediately sending their team to right. And so it is a traded out neutral objective split. Titans happy just to get themselves the Fury. And they'll give Pyro right back to the Kings. What do you think, Myth? We building up to a 20-minute Fire Giant dance where one pull, one grab, one misstep potentially ends this game. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be the case, but I, I'm not certain which team's going to start that dance. Generally, you have to have an invite. It takes two to tango. And mm. if nobody goes there first, it's just going to be farming up, making sure you hit level 20. Which squad feels more confident in their ability to team fight now? Who's hit their power spikes already? I'm looking at both the mid laners. Paul has massive burst potential. This soul gem finished up, giving over a little bit of sustain. Big man Ting's largely in the exact same position. A half item lead there. Relics though, very good for the Camelot Kings. The Tartarus Titans still reeling a bit from that elongated fight on the left. If the Kings decide to group up on fire, the Tartarus Titans have to respond. You're gonna slow down their farm. Yep. Could be worthwhile, but if I know the Kings, they want to play it slow, and they have faith in their own ability at the latest portions of the game. If they could time skip 20 minutes into the future and have this be a 40-minute match, they would. I think it's, it's really just going to be a, a slow going, wait for the picks. And only one of this composition is built around finding those picks. The Tartarus Titans, if it's not a group fight, yeah. I, I favor them. Now, the Titans have given themselves every opportunity here in game three. In games one and two, we were breaking open Phoenixes by the 20 minute mark. It's a team that has not quit. They went five games yesterday. They were able to win it. You're going to have to go the distance here against the Kings. Got to start in game three. What you're seeing is a bit more confidence, though, from this Titans team. Playing around those carries, allowing Sino to operate, affecting six of the eight kills. 
This Pele had something a bit more to say about it. Tino, a roar, maybe rewinding the clock a bit a few seasons ago where they were able to win a Smite World Championship. Finding that dynamic synergy again here in game three would uh, maybe make that story come alive a bit further. But big man Ting Smith, I think he's had a nice turnaround on the other side. Off to an 0-3 start, added a kill and an assist since then. Earthshaker starting to connect a bit. Top XP per minute in the game as well. Big man Ting's one of the best farmers there is. And he's sticking with it despite a rough start. Just can't slow him down. Even when he was 0-3 immediately on that third death, at most we saw it about a half level lead over towards Paul. Significant grouping on the right-hand side. Seems both teams have agreed 20 minutes will be that timer. Ooh, Aurora misses. It's a lot of poke. No pull from Aurora, but he's pulled back in. Is he going to use Wrath of Terra? No, he's not. Sot's got coverage for his support. A little bit of poke damage on the Sino. You're going to have to think twice before you dive Big Man Ting's and Earthshaker into an Aegis. Buys you enough time to trade out some damage. For now, it'll be a water spout up. Disengage from the Titans. I don't know, another minute and 45 seconds on that Fury. There's a world where, where we're wondering which team feels confident enough to go left, which team is allowing that Fire Giant to be open. That's a nice starter. Ooh, jumps the in. Roar. The pull onto Variety. SOT rotating through out of the jungle. Odin again walks away relatively unscathed. That Sylvanas ultimate is a massive component of the Tartarus Titans team fight. Without it, you're lacking a good deal of CC. The Camelot Kings maybe could look to exploit this opportunity. No Pyromancer, not an easy pickup. Fury off the map and still not confident enough to look towards the Fire Giant. I, I would love to know how the Camelot Kings are looking to address the Phantom Shell pickup. Aurora has finished that one up. Variety's cage likely what the Tartar Titans are holding it for. But if Genetics wants to, if he locks him down in the jungle pass, could force out that Relic. Variety with a good deal of CDR could just go in and see if he can just generate enough threat to get it off. The Camelot Kings essentially have to work through that resource before they can fully commit. Captain Twig, Variety, Genetics, they see Sot. Back flip away. Small storyline, haven't touched on yet. It's a two level lead for Aurora over Genetics. Call it one, of course, right when I talk about it, but a slight lead for the Titan support. Far from what we've seen in that support role throughout the rest of the game, but something to keep your eye on. Big man Tings, he'll hit level 20 first in the game as that farming has continued. If, if you told Tings after an 0-3 start, he'd be the first to hit level 20. He'll take that every single day of the week. And you know, Mef, I, I always get scared around these late game objective fights. You know that. Yeah, you're a scaredy cat for sure. Terrified of, of almost everything. And now it's big man Tings who's got an earth shaker. And it's Paul who's got a crushing wave. I'm foreseeing objective secure battles and it might Whoa. happen right now. The Camelot Kings Whoa. immediately rotating to the fire giant. Again, I was asking good zone. who's gonna leave the FG open. It's the it's Titans low. who've got to rotate in. And it's the Kings who get it. On a double pullback throw from Genetics, there's still damage. Yark, he's in the FG pit. Yark is going to lose his buff to Paul. But is there enough chase down from the Titans? No, not enough. The Tartar Titans have to let this one go. They've taken out the battery of the Camelot Kings. Steal that phrase from Hurry when on the desk had said, if you want to push with your fire, it needs to be with the Hunter. If the Hunter hasn't got it, it's really slow oh my going God. Oh my God. around these towers. The Camelot Kings aren't concerned. This would be amazing for the Titans if you can pull back another Gotta buff. Kill him. Gotta Variety kill him. is going to get stunned. Oh, but a pull from Genetics gets it done with the landfalls and gets it done with the escape. Variety lives, four buffs still left on the map. I, I cannot believe the Camelot Kings step back up there. I, I'm, I'm ready to, getting ready to hop on my soapbox, have That's the right. whole monologue while we wait for your core to respawn. Not the case, the Camelot Kings not willing to give up anything. Still a very good position though. You might be lacking the Hunter's Fire Giant, but everybody else has got it, so your kill pressure is there. The ability to tank up these structures is certainly there as well. Not that you have to go there first. Instead, only Fury under pressure. The Tartarus Titans, they're very far up here. I wasn't expecting this. Yarkor has global presence. Even if he's not there now, he can get there at a moment's notice. 2,000, 2,500 gold lead for the Camelot Kings. Fire Giant making a difference. But, but this is where shot calling so important for the Titans. What you cannot do is allow this 2,500 to become 5,000, to become 6,000 after just one Fire Giant buff for the Kings. Cage, cage dropped. It's a, pull. it's a double pullback from Genetics, and in Stu's he goes. Stuck. Earthshaker hits a couple, and the Kings have found their opening, 
and they will follow it up. A chase down, Twig wants it, Twig gets it. Double kill for the King's Jungle. Paul decides to stand his ground, nearly turns it around. Twig barely survives, but it's three deaths for the Tartarus Titans all around the Fury. Twig, go ahead, reset, should join his team soon. The rest of the Kings, they keep up the siege. Sino, SOT, they've got it all to do. This Phoenix, it's under threat. No chance, right, Paul? 40 seconds, Stewart, 30, Sino. Sot's got a back. Still channeling his back. SOT just Let now go. is going to get back to base. The most lucrative Phoenix on the map. It's gone to the Kings. And the Kings with an early FG pull. Find three kills. Find 5K gold and a left side bird. That's the danger of stepping up to the gold fear. You're so concerned about that gold lead spooling out of control. You said it. Can't let three become four or four become five. That's ringing in the ears of the Tartarus Titans starts playing at their mindscape and instead step up trying to prevent the fury and get punished massively. The time is now if you're the Titans. You gave yourself every opportunity early in the third game. Now base defense ever so difficult. The weight of the world, the hammer on stage pressing down on your base while the Kings Captain Twig chasing his first, potentially Mifflin, one grouping, one team fight from making that dream a reality, from claiming his championship. 30 seconds left on the Fire Giant, minute and a half till it spawns. The Tartarus Titans showing some fight here. Grouped significantly, might look for a pick, but it's the front line that they meet, and no way you can burn down variety or genetics, not fast enough. So the Tartarus Titans forced to seed space. The Camelot Kings take a peek at their pockets. Plenty of vision to be had as Variety leads the charge. Wow, Aurora, he's going to get caught into the cage. This time, it's a quiet one. No pull on the answer back from the Sylvanas. Fire Giant just now falls off. What a successful first FG push for the Camelot Kings. They're going to force confusion out of the Titans now. Saad has upgraded that teleport. He'll be able to get back to the right side, help defend. In a hush of the Camelot Kings fans here as they're wondering if this next fight might just be it. The Titans can even afford to step up. You might have to, another FG push from the Kings. If it might just be enough. The Tartarus Titans haven't got the best steal potential simply because Paul's gonna struggle to get in towards the fire giant pit. So with steals off the table, it's all about the fight. Can the Tartarus Titans find their footing? Who's starting it for them? It's got to be SOT. We said it earlier, need to separate the Camelot Kings. Ever since they've been capable of grouping up as five, the fights have started looking a bit more one-sided. Whoa, this could be a good start. A roar with an ultimate onto genetics. Variety. So tanky. Over the back harpies right now. Stuart, a little bit of damage for the tanks, but a little bit maybe an overstatement. The next will walk away, okay, walk away okay. Fire Giant respawns now. Titans staring down the Kings from across the backside of the jungle where many battles have been fought over the last three games. And Myth, one more to be fought. Watch out for Genetics. He's made miracle plays happen all weekend long. One big landfall, one big cage into an Earthshaker. Seals up the deal. Camelot Kings get the pyro. An early opening on another missed pull from Aurora. Man, the Camelot Kings, because of their long range damage, the front line becomes more threatening. Variety, if he stuns you, you're worried about a meatball or even just his own follow up. Or Sino's in trouble. Sino's in trouble. He'll avoid the Earth Shaker. And a, a landfall ball. again. It's on to two. Look Genetics at Paul. refuses to miss. Paul out of the Aegis. He'll survive this time. But Genetics has got a swing. He'll remind the Titans of Good it. Pull. A roar pulled back. And a roar killed off. SOT on the retreat. How long on the stun? That's a good slow. Variety's right behind him. SOT falls. Captain Twig. Credit for the kill. Where the, are they going? It's not fire. They're going mid, Miff. The Camelot Kings, they're looking for mid. They're looking for tier two. A roar dead for 30. SOT dead for 50. The Camelot Kings considering an end. Body language will tell it all. Camelot Kings, is it just the bird? Do you want mid? Do you want Oh, left? they're going. They're moving in. Variety leads the charge. No, you got not. some time to play with. Start backing up. Enhanced Minion Wave should take care of that left side bird. 
Back up to the fire. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. Left side Phoenix remains alive. What? The Titans aren't getting that wave, though. But Yeah, the wave's going to end up. They, it's going to take it down. I think it's going to take it down on the back end. There's not enough. Left side Phoenix ends up dropping. What? And Myth, the Kings have not gone Paul! back. They're baiting out they the fire. Paul's in mid. Paul's in mid. Does not have beads. Does not have Aegis. Does not have an any carry. Big man takes. Delete to it. Aurora stunned. It's a double kill. The Camelot Kings, they will drop three members of the Titans. The Tartarus Titans lose the thread. The Camelot Kings, simply by walking to the jungle, distract. They've done it. The Camelot Kings, after one more fight, they'll get the ring for Twig. Untouched, unscathed, bow down to your Kings. The Camelot Kings, champions of the world. Not a single loss for the Camelot Kings at this event. It may have looked iffy at times, but you have to put faith in your rulers. The Tartarus Titans fall. They may have fought back, but not hard enough. Give it up for the Camelot Kings! You did not drop a single game this tournament. How does that feel? It feels absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of the boys. So proud of Biggie as well. He had phenomenal drafts. He came to every game with a new plan. And, you know, I was so proud. Couldn't be more happy. Congratulations. I mean, in that final game, though, it looked like it could have gone the other way. What was the turning point for your team? Uh, oh, Biggie was a massive help in uh, the comp and the, the draft. He knew exactly what to do. Uh, honestly, that's what won as well. We just drafted every fucking game. Oh. Twig, it's been nine long years, and you have finally claimed the title. Feel. Amazing. It feels like I'm in a dream. Uh, I haven't woken up yet. Uh, hopefully, this dream never stops. Big Man Tings to win the World Championships in front of all of these people, all of your fans. What do you have to say? Honestly, it's a dream come true. Thank you for everybody. Even if you said it once, win the Kings. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yark the Shark, MVP last year, winning Worlds this, this year. How does that feel? Just another day in the office for me. How proud are you of this team? I'm very proud. I don't know, I've lost a lot of semi-finals and a lot of finals, and I kept expecting something to go wrong. It just feels kind of surreal still, you know. Everyone, give it up for the Camelot Kings.
And let's head back to the desk. You can feel it. You can hear it. You can see it. Emotion Woo. running high for the Kings. Who else at the forefront? The Captain Twig. Guys, cheer for him one more time. Give it up for the Kings. Exciting times for him. A team that has looked so good, so good all year long. And to be able to step up to this level. And we're talking a rough start to the year, honestly. You go yep. back, phase one, fifth seed, a little rough for them. First in phase two, and they fall in the Spring Masters. And they fall in the Summer Masters. They make a roster change. They come in third. Twig says it's just a slump. Nothing to worry about. And since then, they've done nothing but prove themselves to be the best team in Smite. They get first place the Phase 3 playoffs. They are untouched throughout Worlds. You have to think the other side, Trelly. It's a Cinderella story, but the, the glass slipper shatters. It's broken instead for the Tartarus Titans here. They tried to make the run. But it just comes a little shy. Have to celebrate the Kings here just for some excellent games. I mean, don't get me wrong. A fantastic performance of the Tartarus Titans. The fact that that team was just uh, broken for so long. So many different pieces moving and shaking. For them to get here, unexpected. However, the Camelot Kings, the uncontested best team in the world. And I don't think there's a shadow of a doubt about that one. Now you can see they set it on the stage. But not a single team could take a game off of the champions here in season nine. If you've ever wondered if they were deserving of the crown, they've just proved, proven it right then and there. Maybe one of the most applicable names. Hurry, that game. A lot of times, a lot of kills start out for the Titans. Yeah, I think, we all, I think we all had some hope for the Titans yeah. that game, right? First I think few minutes? Maybe there was a time in which we thought they were actually going to be able to kind of bring it back. I was kind of believing in that dream. But even with so many kills, yeah. even with a big kill advantage, they were never really very far ahead. And I think that kind of tells the story of what this Kings team has been doing, what they're so good at doing. They never panicked. They let people die who were, were dead to rights. They didn't overcommit for things that they weren't ready to fight for. They did a great job of trading out the objectives on the map. And ultimately, King's gameplay is just good smite. And that is tough to play against when they're on a, such a tear like they are in this tournament. Now, Hazer, call me out if I'm wrong. And as easy and fun as it is, you know, we've seen variety on the final stage. We've seen Twig at every World Championship. Easy to get swept up in those moments. But I want to look to the other side of the map, not just genetics but specifically Hardcore. Last year's World's MVP not only adds his name on the list of players who have done it back to back, but if you're looking at Hardcore, you're talking about the first player to do it on multiple roles. Unbelievable. Back to back in two different roles, opposite sides of the map, but he still has just as much influence. And I think Genetics has talked about it. Hardcore, a big shot caller for this team. Genetics says, when I'm hot, he's cold. He calms this team down. And you can tell that the improvement that they brought, a lot of it, is that they never make big mistakes. They never throw games. And I don't think this pickup from Hardcore can be talked about enough. I mean, the swap, look, you're dropping a player like Netroid. You need to fill those shoes. And I think he does it in a beautiful way. And this is something I love even more, celebrating your win, doing something you can only do when you have fans in front of you and enjoying the crowd. Just an amazing, amazing weekend for the Camelot Kings. Mechanical play, all of it. Just looks amazing. And you I can think tell that, that Twig, it's not even real for Twig yet. There it is, that's when it's settled. <laughs> the realization. The, the Titan was dead and he's still like, I need to see victory. When I see the victory screen, I'll get up and celebrate with you guys. I've been working for this 
for such a long time, just about a decade. And the, the world where Captain Twig has a ring, that's the world I want to live in. It's about time. Oh yeah. I think it's about time. It is, it is about time. I, I'm glad to kind of silence the haters a bit here. Yeah. You can't say that anymore. I he mean, has even... a ring. And not only does he have a ring, <laughs> they didn't lose a single game the whole weekend. I mean, come on now. It's not yeah. even, he's not a, a secret good player, good teammate. <laughs> <laughs> he just, just won world player. championships. Yeah. He's one of the goats, and you really can't put it any other way. I've got to try this one on for size, because we've never gotten to say it. World champion Captain Twig. Has a good ring to it, Hazer. Chills. Feels really nice. Chills. You get to add that to everyone up there. And again, while Twig steals the show, right. He's gone to the final so many times. I mean, look, I'm looking at season three banner. It's the one that's right in front of me. And that is the same one where despite losing, the crowd, everybody was like, no, Variety deserves MVP. He only doesn't get it from maybe pure technicality. It feels good to see him standing up there and lifting that trophy as well. Yeah, so much so. I mean, a player who's been through ups and downs in his career, but he's always kind of come out on these strong teams and been highly regarded by all of his ex-teammates. Seems that he always puts on a show when he gets to the world stage, especially Paul on the other side definitely has that mantle. But Variety, does he join up there? Is he becoming one of these players that has that world's legacy, that world's performance that just cannot be topped by anyone else, Trelly? Uh, I would say so. I think a fantastic performance. Uh, I did not expect all these different god pools, and I guess that shouts out to Biggie as well. They, you heard them say it. If we can't prepare for these different comps, the other team certainly is going to have some trouble trying to figure out picks and bands wise. I mean, yeah. you think you come with a linear strategy, but every single game it changed up. That's how they come into a full world's run and don't drop a single game because no one knew what to expect. And Harry, you were even talking about it, right? Game one to game two, they keep one element that's the same. And Hazer had pointed it out. The only thing that then changes is they, they throw the ROM all of a sudden into mid, so everything is different. And then you get even more in game number three. You get some spicy picks from the Titans and, again, some looks that, that feel really good. And I have to give them credit where credit's due. You're still in the top two in the world and proven that this weekend if you're the Tartarus Titans. But the command that the Kings brought this weekend, and specifically, as mentioned now, in picks and bans, in draft, and mechanical play, it just feels unmatched. I think the Kings put a priority on picks and bans like, nobody else in the league. Everyone knows it's important, but that team lives and dies by their drafts. Yeah. You can just hear it in their post-game interviews that they're just bringing up drafts all the time because that's what matters to them more than anybody, anything else. They mm -hmm. care about gameplay. They care about how they're playing their picks. But first and foremost, the very first thing that has to happen every game is a good draft. And their drafts look so clean. No issues in their drafts. They have everything yeah. you need. Engage, late game, area control, Crowd control, CC chains that Hazer <laughs> mentioned, that they do a very good job compared to other teams, making sure that they have good CC chains. Uh, they've just got a lock on it, and they had a lock on it this weekend yeah. more than any other team. And I think going forward in future events, next year and on, people should look to this tournament and see what the Kings did here, because if you want to win, you should emulate what they did. Yeah, I mean, it could be something that changes some of the future of Smite that we see, what they did here today and what they did this week. And of course, as we've done with other awards just today in the Golden Bolts, we want you at home to vote for us. And so if you are wondering about the MVP, the most valuable player here from the World Championship, you have a chance uh, to go on social media, vote for them, uh, and they will be announced later after the votes come through. And so a lot of, of well, a lot of conversation, I think, that could be had around that, Trelly. It feels like I can make an argument in, in my mind for everybody up there, oh yeah, I will admit maybe feeling a little more more biased towards uh, genetics just because of some of the plays we saw, and of course it's not just our reactions, it's not just the crowd reactions we saw. Uh, of course on Twitter we see you out there, those of you who were reaction or reacting with hashtag Worlds with fans. What a beautiful picture as well. <laughs> nice, centered, the hands up at the bottom, and yeah, you have to imagine a congrats to the Camelot Kings. I'll admit with that one, I was uh, a little more focused on the hot dog costume. I thought you were talking <laughs> the about Avatar. the dude chugging orange juice in the first one. <laughs> no, no, and now, just a lot of fun. Of course, the Thundersticks, they can be retired. Uh, with all the cheers that came out, all the success. And the third 3-0 finals in Smite history.
And unfortunately for the Titans, two of them, back to back, Trelly, were them. Different team, different players, for the most part. Uh, the same brand falling twice in the final. I mean, I still think in this particular final, the Tartarus Titans coming to second place was a, a fantastic run for yeah. them as well. I mean, like I said. They didn't even it, qualify it, directly to the event. It cannot be understated how they did not look great in the qualifiers. Right? Yeah. Like, no one predicted them to be able to get out of the quarters. I mean, let's say half, maybe their fans in total, but everyone else was like, there's no way. And then the semifinals didn't look too much better either on paper, but they, they proved time and time again, they deserve to be in that number two spot. And they put up a heck of a fight. It was just the Camelot Kings are the best team in the world this weekend. And I, I agree with what Harry was saying. I think their drafts were just disgusting. That's season nine, right? They, they, it's not just the weekend. They've got it all in the venue, guys. I want to hear it one more time for the Camelot Kings who have won the season nine world championship. And I want to say from myself, all of the other casters and analysts, everyone back in production, all of our sponsors, and of course, all of the wonderful people here who helped make this world possible. I want to thank everyone in venue so much for watching, whether you were here or in the venue or if you were at home or anywhere else. Thank you so much for tuning in, for making this possible, for celebrating Smite with us the way we have. And we'll get to see you in season 10.